Shema Israel Yahuwah Eloheinu Yahuwah Shema Israel Shema Israel Shabbat Shalom, welcome to Landway Ministries. It's a nice Shabbat. It's cold over here in Southern California. They say it never rains. Well, the weather just made that song a lie because it's raining today and we enjoy it because we need it. Thank you, Father, for this lovely rain. Well, we got some good stuff in store. I so said, get ready to get your thinking caps on. We're going to go a little deeper. Last week was a little uh, uh, gentle, the week before was a little harsher. Because Kyle said that that was foundation. <laughs> yeah, that was foundation. Last week, kind of gave you a little break. And this week, we're going to dive in. We got some, some uh, 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 spiritual applications and understanding some science. What they call science, what we call how Father has created things, and then connecting all that together. First, I want to say uh, hello and welcome to all the new ones that have subscribed. Even this morning, I saw a couple people have subscribed, so welcome. And we appreciate uh, you coming to our uh, YouTube channel and uh, seeking out our teachings. So I hope that you're ready for this. Um, and what I usually do and what happens here in the beginning for those who are new, I start with the um, comments or uh, not comments, announcements. And then usually Sister Jeanette comes up and reads Tehillim 92, but she's not here today for a very good reason. Well, what reason could be good for not being here at service? Usually there isn't. 
unless it's death, real sickness, or she's having her anniversary with her husband. I believe they are in Utah, so pray that they have a great, wonderful time and they're blessed by Yahuwah. They've been together for 19? 15 years. 15? They've been no. married 15 years together, 19. That's right, that's what it is. So they've been together, they've been married 15 together, 19 years. And um, he's her one and only. So hallelujah for that. She was a maiden when she met him. So hallelujah for that. So we, 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 we celebrate with her and her husband uh, within our hearts there. So, and again, just pray that they're safe. Uh, sister, sister Aiden says it's three degrees where he's at. Oh, three degrees. Oh, three degrees. Brother Aiden, it's three degrees. I, Sorry, you know, uh, you just made me colder. <laughs> and my hands just got real cold after saying that. We're spoiled over here. I, I got to zip up. I got chills. Three degrees. I, how, how cold is it here? I think it's about 58 or 57. So it's 58, 57 here. And that, you know, we're Californians. We're spoiled. We, we like the sun and, and heat. We like beaches and parks and, you know, snow. We have snow here too. We do. Uh, but what was I saying? Where was I at? Uh, Jeanette, uh, oh, uh, Sister Jennifer is going to be coming up and reading, uh, Tell Him Leaves 92 in her place, and nice, she has a nice, gentle, lovely voice, and so hopefully she'll project and, and say it with strength, and then, um, I'll go ahead and blow the shofar, and, uh, then we'll pray after that over the offering, over the service, and then we'll get into praise and thanksgiving, and then, do you guys know what's going to happen after that? The meat, we're going to have the meal, which is we're going to learn more about uh, our creators, Yahuwah's a calendar and why we should know it. Yeah. And um, again, um, this is a good thing that we're learning these things and everybody should personally know how to do it. And especially the heads of households, the men, the men need to be able to calculate that. Now, we read last week in scripture, there were certain groups of a, a certain particular tribe and a group within a tribe that really follow this and we can, you can even have that in the congregation as well where there's these you know certain people are prone that father's designed all of us with different talents and abilities different giftings and some are very prone to these things because father made them that way so for those who are hallelujah but we shouldn't rely the whole world was lying on one man and he 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 laid down the mantle um, I'm not too sure why. I think I heard what he said, but uh, he didn't replace himself. And so now the whole world, we've been as a as a Torah observant community. No matter what you call yourself, we're all over the place right now. And it's good to get back to what Scripture says. What does the Scripture say? The the Scriptures, and we're doing some comparisons to the four main different um, ways of calculating. We'll get into that a little later. Um, but I want to talk about Minister Tamar, um, the, why we're international, we're over in Pakistan, now, oh, now, oh, excuse me, we're over in India, the continent of India, uh, which is Pakistan and India, as well as we're in Canada as well, and some other places I'm, I'm hearing, we're over in England now, um, Australia, and there's, uh, oh, oh, um, oh, come on, Derek, the island off of Pakistan, uh, thank you, Sri Lanka, sorry, Brother Aiden, but, uh, Sri Lanka, um, so we're over there, and, and so I wonder where else. Oh, I know we're in Africa and different continents in Africa because we people have reached out, and so I'm just wondering who else isn't saying anything. So you know, let us know where you're from if you're watching. It'd be a it'd be a blessing. We'll be very blessed by hearing. You know, where what part of the world you're in. It's nice to know where our brothers and sisters are at. Not everyone has a YouTube account, so not everyone can comment. A lot of the viewers might just be, uh, you know. People going okay. on YouTube. So if you don't have a YouTube account, for those that do, Brother uh, Kyle was telling me that some won't be able to do that because you may not have a YouTube account. If you do not, that's okay. Email us. There's the phone number at the end. Leave it on the message, message machine. I know this generation, for some reason, doesn't like to leave messages. Uh, that's weird to me. Um, because I don't understand that. That's, that's what message machines are for. They just hang up. I hear a lot of clicks. I get to it and there's clicks. I'm like, nobody's gonna leave a message. So please leave a message. It's it's okay. Try it. If you're if that that's something you're used to, just stretch out and do something you're not used to. It's just very simple. I know it may be weird to this newer generation. 
We we want to know, okay? So uh, or Facebook us if you have Facebook. Also, um, so uh, Minister Tamor is our minister over in Pakistan of Line Away Ministries, and he is an amazing 24 year old now. Man is 22, 21, 22. And again, his life, and I say this every service, is all about you. Who is amazing because when you look on the western side of the world, you don't meet many young men like him. Uh, he's definitely a diamond in a rough. And uh, under severe persecution, he is um, doing Father's work um, wholly. Um, and, and he's been he's in a Muslim country where they have already said they were going to kill him last year sometime. Uh, they were going to remove him from his home or his whole family was going to get moved somewhere else. And in spite of that, if you watch the history, if you've seen um, even um, Are We in the End Time series, which is still not complete yet. Um, in the End Time series, we talked about, uh, we got into, um, what do you call it, persecution. And what happened, if you look in scripture, what happened in persecution. If you look secularly, where scripture doesn't flow into, um, you also see that um, the word got out even more. It got out even more. So that's what's happening over there as well. Um, within a, a, a six, seven month period, he went from one uh, smaller congregation to an additional uh, three to four more. So we went from about 50 people to now around five to 600 people that are over there who are now being educated and being grown. A large amount of them are children of many ages, from very little to teenagers now. I've watched some of them grow. And it's been wonderful. And uh, they, they, the last time we did service with them, uh, we were passing out clothes uh, for them. And uh, they were quoting scripture by memory. They got up and in, in their language, which is Ordu, which is an offshoot of Hebrew. They are descendants, DNA descendants of Hebrews, which blew my mind. When uh, The Rock brought that to my attention, M Minister Tamara kind of mentioned that to me. And then I'm studying here in my home, and Father goes, get that book. And I go, okay. So I get the book, and I'm going to start from where I left off. He said, start from the beginning. I was like, well, to be honest, I was like, I didn't want to. I wanted to continue. Well, I had missed something. I had missed that. These Hebrews had went over into Pakistan, and they spoke Urdu. That was the language they commonly spoke. And I said, wow. So I was really excited about that. Father has amazing ways, and we just need to listen to him. And so continue to pray for him and his family um, and keep them strong. Um, they did have a loved one who passed, an aunt. Um, so um, please pray for their comfort and uh, all the family members and friends who were affected by that. Minister Tomorrow, heart goes out to you and in your family. And please let them know we love you, uh, that we love them as well, and that we're praying for their, for their comfort. Um, also, we have um, um, Pastor P, who's over on the India side of that continent, and he's on the other side of the age range. We got a elderly man, uh, mid sixties, over his sixty, uh, over mid sixties. Um, you know, he and he's vigorous and strong. He's getting out there. He's preaching the the truth that I meant of Yahuwah. He's teaching. He's going to Christian churches. He's being invited uh, to express the true name of Yahuwah of Yahusha and um, all these things and getting rid of the false uh, doctrines and pagan celebrations and they're receiving it with gladness and joy is blessing them and so many over there in India are turning over to the, the, the way the way and become a Nazarim so that that's very exciting and awesome to be a part of and we help them by your donations as well uh, we help dig a well we helped uh, 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 repair a motor to the uh, one that was already there. And not only were our people blessed by it, our Mishpacha, but also the community was. Because we are the seed of Abraham through Yahusha. And we're blessed to be a blessing to all the nations. That's what we should be. So wherever you go, wherever you're at, whatever family you're in, wherever job you're at, whatever neighborhood you're in, whatever ethnic group you belong to, you have been planted there to be a blessing to them. Remember that. Remember the fruit that you're bearing. Remember your behavior. We're to have our behavior to be a certain way amongst the Gentiles. And we are definitely amongst the Gentiles. Uh, we also do ear, nose, and eye clinic. We uh, over there in dentistry as well. Um, we also, uh, what is it, um, help the, um, the leopards. 
by providing the things that they need and caring for them, showing them love. You know, really importantly, the fact that Pastor P even goes out there to them. You know, in their country, there's classes and, and levels, and you're locked in. Once you're poor, you're always poor, you know. And they are at a certain class, the untouchables, and um, they, they're stuck, which is kind of they're in quarantine. <laughs> we think we're, we're just getting used to this quarantine. Well, they've been in quarantine, you know, for a long time, and it's a way of life. And uh, the fact that anybody goes out there to care for them who isn't a leopard is absolutely astonishing to them. So they're very grateful for the love that we express to them through Pastor P's ministry. So again, thank all of you out there who have been led to uh, give um, to to us to be able to give to those who are in need. Now, I, I want I want to um, we've had several people reach out to this ministry for help. Um, you know, we, we do have some obligations that we have right now that we have uh, said that we were going to do. I talked about two of them already. And then whatever we have left over, um, uh, we may be able to do some things. We've helped our Mishpaka with certain ones who needed help um, economically or with food or, or whatever it was. If, if, if you are seeking um, help monetarily, that we have some guidelines. We would love to do that. But as you guys know, we have to be wise with Father's money. There are people out there who are scammers. They go from congregation to congregation. I've seen it personally. And they just ask for money. And, and, and they just move on to the next congregation. Even when I was in Babylon, I saw that happen. They would go to all the churches in the area. And they would get, get, get. And weren't in discipleship. We were just receiving. So we want to be good, and I'm, we're listening to the Ruach. And if you, you have to be in fellowship with us at least a year. You have to be in fellowship with us at least. And when I mean in fellowship, you're engaging. You're not a stranger. You're somebody we know. And, uh, so, and we, we need to see your growth also as well. And I'm not saying that if the Ruach says give, we don't give. Of course we give. Um, even if those those standards aren't met but those are the usual standards and sometimes father pulls us out of those standards but he also gave us those standards to go by so um just so you guys are aware of that as as well um and, and of course i'm going to have a, a nice conversation with you personally and get to know you and we'll go from there because we have to protect what's fathers we're, we're good stewards and so um we just don't give everywhere and anywhere just because somebody says so we give where father says and where it's, it's truly needed and it's not Satan sending somebody because trust and believe don't think Satan don't send people to drain uh congregations or send people to uh, uh misdirect uh my attention to something and i need to be dealing with this over here it happens it's true um i i try to be sober to the devices of the enemy as we all need to be so thanks again for everything that has been given to this ministry to give back out. You you shall be blessed by it. That's what scripture says. Now, we'll talk about tithe. We don't tithe because we can't. There's no priesthood anymore. That type, that system is done away with. Now, they're right about that, but they took that and said all of it is. No, that system is done away with. Okay. So, so, uh, we, we give offerings because there's tithe and offerings. So we don't give tithe because that's not possible. There's no, as far as we know, I don't believe anybody here is a Levitical priesthood <laughs> of the Luites. Um, that could be possible, but that system is done away with. Yahushua repla is the replacement of it. It's a better way. Hallelujah. We don't have to drag across no lambs and sheep and all this stuff, goats and having pigeons and doves to sacrifice we we pray from a sincere heart and ask for forgiveness whenever and wherever whenever and wherever you may be you don't have to travel and do all that he made it so easy and hallelujah for that so uh, just wanted to mention that so it's offerings that we do take in they're still today they were given offerings in the renewed testament um you see saul go by on the first day of the week by a congregation on his way to jerusalem and he takes um what they gathered for funds for the widows in Jerusalem. So uh, this is how we take care of the body of people. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Uh, without further ado, um, 
Sister Jennifer, if you'd come up and read Tell Him He Was 92. Tehillim Psalms 92. It is good to give thanks to Yahuwah and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, who declare your loving commitment in the morning and your trustworthiness each night, on ten strings and on the harp, to the sounding chords of the lyre, for you have made me rejoice with your work, O Yahuwah. I shout for joy at the works of your hands. O Yahuwah, how great are your works! Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know, and a fool does not understand this. When the wrongs spring up like grass, and all the workers of wickedness blossom, it is for them to be destroyed forever. But you, Yahuwah, are on high forever. For look, your enemies, O Yahuwah, for look, your enemies do perish. All the workers of wickedness are scattered, but you lift up my horn like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil, and my eye looks upon my enemies. My ears hear the evil doers who rise up against me. The righteous one flourishes like a palm tree. He grows like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of Yahuwah flourish in the courts of our Elohim. They still bear fruit in old age. They are fresh and green to declare that Yahuwah is straight. My rock and in him is no unrighteousness. Tehillim Psalms 92. All right, thank you, Sister Jennifer. That was beautiful. Um, so I was just sent something that was very interesting, um, and you may say, well, why are you going to bring this up? Well, you know, we can't be cold because people aren't not Zerim or they're whatever they are if they're following whatever they may follow. But Larry King apparently has passed away, so we want to send our prayers out and our compassion and love um, to everybody that that affects his family and friends co co-workers and the like and i know many people for years have watched him i know i did as a kid myself and then into adulthood and uh it's not about if he's you know um tour observant or not he's he's a fellow human that has passed mm -hmm. and so we we want to grieve with those who grieve and um so just to let you know we're praying for those out there who it has affected um because, you know, death is a very difficult thing, is it not? That's why it's so good to be with Father, hallelujah, that he's called us out of that uh, sickness um, to where our sins we would have to pay for because the wages of sin is what? Death. And we don't have to worry about that because it's already been paid for us. Hallelujah. So, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll leave that at that. And now we're going to do the blowing of the shafar. <clears throat> Shabbat Shalom, Mishpaka. I will be reciting the Ten Commandments, Shemot, Exodus 20. And Elohim spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the land of slavery. You have no other mighty ones against my face. You do not make for yourself a cart image or any likeness of that which is in the heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, Yahuwah, am a jealous El, visited the crookedness of the fathers on the children, to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, by showing loving commitment to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. You do not bring the name of Yahuwah your Elohim to naught, for Yahuwah doesn't leave the one unpunished who brings his name to naught. Remember the Sabbath day to set it apart. Six days you labor and shall do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahuwah, your Elohim. You do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Yahuwah created the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Therefore, Yahuwah blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart. Respect your father and your mother, so that your days are prolonged upon the soil which Yahuwah, your Elohim, has given you. You do not murder. You do not bear wedlock. You do not steal. You do not bear false witness. You do not covet your neighbor's house. You do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, 
nor whatever belongs to your neighbor. You got this. <laughs> Y'all <laughs> clapping. I'm like, yay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Dear Grace Heavenly Father, Yahuwah, um, thank you for Shabbat. Thank you for teaching us all these things that we've had to grow and learn is special, is set apart, and it proves and shows in part that we're with you, Father, as we do the things that you've called us to do. Ah, thank you for all the teachings that you give us, and every day is a is a class. Every day is a learning, uh, and your mercies are new every day for us to start as you grant us life, Father. Thank you for allowing us to see what's going on in the world so that we can cherish our position with you and where you've placed us. A lot of times, we as children get complacent, um, we get lackadaisical, and we forget what you are doing for us daily. As we look at other situations as we should and are able to see uh, the lack of provision, the lack of health, the lack of mental stability, the lack of peace, the lack of all these things that we have as inherent and right through Yahushua HaMashiach. So once again, we say halal, Yahuwah, for you are worthy of that praise and honor for you are great and merciful to your people when we are in obedience to you. Father, we, we give this service over to you. We want you to speak your word, not man's word. We want to be corrected. We want to be educated in your ways. And then we want to have wisdom in it by applying your ways in our lives. For all to see, first you, our, then our mishpacha, and then the world. For we are to lead them by being a light to them out of the darkness into your marvelous light. Father, we want to bless all those who are able to give. Uh, this time around, please bless their hearts for being generous and being willing, um, out of joy to do it, not begrudgingly, but seeing and testing you, as you said to do on a Malachi, uh, that test you in this. If you would not open a storehouse, uh, excuse me, open the heavens and uh, fill up our storehouses so much that it would be overwhelming us. It would overflow and Father, let's be generous with that overflow to give when your Ruach directs us to do so, Father. Let's not lean to our own understanding, but in every way, you'll seek your wisdom out in your ways. Father, let this praise and thanksgiving that you are so worthy of, may it warm your heart. May we diligently, may we not just do it because it's traditional, but really because we're in relationship with you and, and that's what we love to do. You know, it's wonderful to see children. We were talking earlier about how uh, uh, children dance. We want to see them dance uh, because it warms our hearts. They don't have to be good dancers. They just got to dance. And we love it. We love it. <laughs> and so, Father, we know that you love it as well. So, Father, uh, uh, let us have that understanding and let us dance freely before you inside and out. For we know there's many different ways of expressing it, and we know it's in your scriptures. We praise and honor you in this moment of time. We turn ourselves in this ministry and this uh, service over to you. And Yahushua's my name. We declare and decree all these things. Hallelujah. So let it be. So it shall be. All right. Let's get to praising.
Shalom Mishpacha. I have requested for funding for food here in Pakistan, Mishpacha. Here, Pakistan inflation rate too much increase. Every food items are 50% prices increase. So here, too much increase the inflation. So please support us, help us, and do fun for food here in Mishpacha for Pakistan. Thank you so much. Love you. Uh, I'm on the area of a flood. See here, the houses are in the flood, are damaged, and uh, people are going to in another area, uh, living in the shelters. So pray for them and uh, uh, keep uh, pray for little children and uh, pray for all of them uh, who's living in Pakistan in flood area and all the others. Uh, who's living in Pakistan because we need your support we need your uh, help we need your fund for food and any others uh, you know, little uh, um, uh, living items so uh, pray for houses um, because they are living in the shelters so pray and uh, do help in me thank you so much
Be 
to you Yes, I find my way back to you Cried out to you as I prayed Father, please have mercy on me today Help me find my way back to you I believe the way I'm running back to you Melecha Olam Melecha Olam Yahweh Yahweh Melecha Olam Melecha Olam Yahweh Yahweh Help me find my way Back to you I believe the way I'm running back to you I worship you as my king Creator of everything Now I see the way back to you I'm running back to you You turn my morning into dancing Your word restores and makes me glad Now I will sing and not be silent Oh praises to the great I am All praises to Melech HaOlam Melech HaOlam Yahuwah Yahuwah this day I'm running back to you Oh, yeah, you restore my soul. 
Your goodness and mercy shall follow me. It shall follow me. Oh, wow, oh, oh. Your goodness and mercy shall follow me. It shall follow me. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Your goodness and mercy shall follow me. It shall follow me. Oh, 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 oh. Your goodness and mercy shall follow me. It shall follow me. Good shepherd, and you restore my soul, you restore my soul. You restore my soul, you restore my soul. Yeah, you restore my soul. When I'm feeling low, you restore my soul. I already know. Restore my soul. Sometimes I just feel blue, and you restore my soul. You make me feel brand new. You restore my soul. In the times I can't go on, you restore my soul. You give me a brand new song. You restore my
Our Father who in heaven reigns How great and mighty is your name Your kingdom come, your will be done Now here on earth as is above Oh, give to us our daily bread And keep our hungry spirits fed May all our satisfaction be In you whose grace has set us free Give us hope, give us faith Help us trust in your guidance From the depths of your grace You have richly provided Thank you, thank you Father, you are all we need Father, you are all all our trespasses as we forgive when sin though evil seeks to hide your face we fix our eyes on you by give us hope give us faith Help us trust in your guidance From the depths of your grace You have richly provided Thank you, thank you Father, you are all we Yeah, I take my hand up high 
Get so excited when I think of all the things you've done for me. Do as you will, you want done with me. Oh, yeah, cause I'm tired of fighting. Sometimes it gets hard, I cannot do it alone. Cause I need you, yeah, on my side. You are the light Up high To worship you To worship you My knees All praise to you All praise to you Up high To worship you I vow to be humble Y'all hearken to my sincere supplication When I'm weak and when I stumble You are always there to catch me when I fall You are my rock and salvation Only one that I can trust, you're my best friend Whenever I'm in doubt, to you I'll give a shout With hands held high, I'll be calling on your name Yeah, I raise, I raise To worship you Bow down, all praise to you Up high I need you Yeah, I need you Yeah, I need you Oh, I need you Oh, I need you Oh, I need you I need you
והקללה. I really hope you enjoyed the praise and thanksgiving. Do I need the light on? There we go. Um, because, you know, as that song I spoke of, uh, about last week, Devoted to Yah, I tell you, the more I hear it, man, it doesn't touch me because of, you know, the times in my life where those things really happened, where I really needed him. And, and I thought that was it. I'll give you one quick example. I was in a car that was had tags that was uh ooh, three years old at this point i'm homeless and my car is my home a police officer i get into a, a turn lane to go onto a freeway police officer comes right up behind me i thought that was it i thought that was it i said they're gonna take the car and all my stuff i got everything in here and i cried out to father i said father i don't, I don't know if i can handle being you know just laying on the streets you know and i said I, Please don't let that happen to me. This officer pulled out from behind me. And you know that's unusual for a lot of reasons. I know he saw them tags. I, I, he pulled over and he looked at me. And I smiled. And he had this look on his face. And it was a smile of nervousness, to be honest. Was like, and he had this look like he wanted to pull me over. For some reason, he couldn't. He couldn't do it. And I know that was father. I know that there's no, there's no explanation for that except for it was my father 
who was protecting me. So in my times of when I was needy, boy, was I needy. I'm going to tell you what happened. I got onto that off-ramp, and I cried like a baby because I knew that was him. Who else could it have been? Why would that happen? Right when I was crying out. And, it, it, you know, so, you know, that song, again, devoted to y'all. Thank you so much, brother, if you're listening or watching. Uh, can't wait to speak to you tomorrow. I get, I get, I'm going to get to speak with him tomorrow. Hopefully that'll work out. And uh, I, I just feel like he pulled that out my own heart, you know, and, and read my heart and made that song. So, uh, and then we have this other song, Freedom to, 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 to Worship, man. By, oh, beautiful song. I'm free to worship him freely. There's nothing in me that's holding me back. It's not embarrassment of what other people think. It's not, it, there's nothing. There's no, I, I can freely worship him. He's giving me that freedom. There's people who can't. They, they can't do it. Turn on their favorite secular artists and they're dancing and jumping around. To praise Yahuwah, all of a sudden they clam up. It's weird. I don't know. I'm uncomfortable. It's amazing. So, you know, we may not think about it, but that's freedom. To be able to worship and honor him. To be able to do that, those who can't are bound up. They're in chains. So, anyway, we're Line Away Ministries. And sometimes people ask, who are we? What are we about? We are first century disciples in the 21st century. What does that even mean? What are you talking about? We don't do any add-ons. We don't do any Constantine Christianity. We don't do Constantine uh, Catholicism. Catholicism. Um, we don't do anything like that. We follow the original ways that the disciples, the emissaries, Yahusha himself, and the prophets, the writings, and the rest do what it says. We don't. We obey that command. That warning, do not add or take away from his word. There's a Psalms that says that as well. As I've said many times before, there have been Christians who have said, well, you're taking that out of context because he said that in Debraim, he was talking about the, the, the commandments, the Torah, and then in Revelation, he says, don't do that. He was talking about that book only. Well, they forgot Psalms. See, they don't, they don't really know all of Scripture. They know a very small amount because they're shepherds. May I say wicked shepherds? May, may I dare say that, are misleading them and won't guide them into those places of refreshment. And so their souls are not refreshed. They are confused. And we are coming out of that confusion as uh, the song says, we're awake now and we walk with him. We understand why things are happening uh, in the world and to us. And, and, and we're, not, we're not asleep. Or as they say, we're woke. All right, we're 21st century disciples making the difference. You should be making the difference in your community, in your home, in your family, within yourself, with your relationship with everybody, and most important, with Yahuwah. And that's where you should be making the difference. Stop looking out at your brothers and sisters. Stop looking at a, a political party. Stop looking at anything that's of this world to make those changes you started. Even the world kind of knows that the change starts with you. Well, yes, the change starts with you, but in Father's way. We are also um, part of a team. We are a team. We're a Nazarene search team. And we're looking for our family members who don't know or who are waking up or who need to be woke up. Either way, we're out there. We're, we're ministering. We are living our lives according to the word so that... Uh, people will recognize and see something different, and they will go, what is that? I mean, why are you like this? You're not normal. You're weird. Yes. Yes. And yes. But one thing they will also say, but you guys are good people. Because Father's ways are above any ways on this planet. They're going to say we're excellent people. He said so, and I can tell you, they may not say it at first, but you let... You stay consistent in walking this walk and growing and maturing. They will come around and go, don't like what you're doing, but you are a better person than what you were. I can't deny that. So don't worry about right now. Sometimes we're a little too fast food believers. We want it right now because everything is fast in this world. <laughs> you know, you get your food fast and, and you, you, know, you microwave this and microwave that and we, we don't wait patiently the way Father has ordered it in his creation. 
And so now we want, we, we've come into the light and we want to drag everybody else into it. And I literally do mean drag because they don't want to come yet. They want to watch. They want to make sure. Remember, you just got into this. What kind of person were you before? What did they know of you before? They got to watch and see if this is real. They got to see if this really works. You correct yourself. You push forward. You make those, um, and I don't want to even say changes, it's transformation. Because I've seen people make change and they change right back. When you transform is when you have done it. And you've transformed in a certain area here, a certain area that you can't go back. Just like a, a, a butterfly that comes out of a cocoon. It'll never be a caterpillar again. It can, it's impossible. So we need transformation in our lives. Let's get to Yerushaya, Isaiah 8, 20. To the Torah and to the witness. If they do not speak according to this, uh, according to this word. What word? Torah. The Torah. That's all they spoke. That's what they understood the word was. It is because they have no daybreak light. If we go to first uh, um uh Yohanan uh chapter one, not first Yohanan, but Yohanan chapter one, we will find out that Yahusha is that light. He's the life and light of mankind. The Torah, Yahusha, is the relationship with Yahuwah, not a religion about him. Some of us in this walk are very religious because we came out of religion, we find the truth, and then we settle back into doing this religiously. And that's a mistake. You, you will get burned out, you will, you will pass out, and you, you won't have the strength to endure to the end. This is not a religion, this is a relationship. And in that relationship is all you need, everything that you need to prosper in this walk. Let's get to the commandments, the covenant, the marriage uh, contract, the Brit, ex Exodus or Shemut 21 through 17. Why do we do this every Sabbath? Because y'all ain't reading it every day. You, are, you guys are not doing it. The majority of you are not. There's a very few of you that, that are reviewing this. You wear seats. That's wonderful. Are you reading what the seats are about? It's not a fashion statement. It's to keep us in alignment. To wear them so that we remember what? His commands. So we're going to read it every Sabbath. Because this is our foundation. And plus there's new people who are coming in. I see new people on the channel. Um, there, there's new believers overall, period. And they need to hear it as well, as well as those who believe they are mature. And the reason why I say that, because a lot that, that believe certain things about themselves ain't true. They're not mature in the walk, and they're not as knowledgeable. They definitely don't aren't exhibiting wisdom in how they walk. So this has to be done. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of Elohim. So we got to hear this over and over and over and over and over and over. Thank you so much. Over and over again. Saying thank you to Brother Kyle who brought me some water mm -hmm. for seeing the future. Or maybe you have a little profit in you. Anyway, all right. Asher, I, I know it's a joke. It's a joke. Sometimes he takes me so literal. There's a song back in the 80s. If you don't know me by now, you will never, never, ever know me. <laughs> oh. All right. Asherif da hada brain, the 10 words, Yahuwah's covenant, our wedding vows. Our wedding vows. Our wedding vows. Little translation, Elohim spoke all these words. One, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of Mitzrayim. So he brought you out of bondage, out of the land of slavery. Well, he did that for us as well. We were enslaved to what? Sin. And if we accept his right hand of friendship, he's going to take their hand, he's going to pull us out of that. That doesn't mean... Okay, what does that what does that mean? When he took them out of Mitzrayim bondage, that were they st still full of sin? Excuse me, guys. Was he, were they still full of sin and not doing right? Absolutely. So it's not about boom, presto changeo. All of a sudden, you have no more sin. That's it. You've accepted Yahusha. You 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 accepted Yahuwah. And you're accepted and adopted into the family. You have no more sin. No, he's brought you out of it now. He brought you out of the, the, the bondage that you were in to help clean you up now. Now, if I pull you out the mud, are you muddy? 
Because I take you out the mud, are you clean just like that? No, you're not. You're still muddy. So now I got to take you and wash you up. And I got to scrub and you got to allow me to do that to you. See, this is where we're at. First, you got to take us out the mud. That's what he did. He took us out of the mud. Then, now the sanctification process takes place where the cleanup comes by the washing of his word. Hallelujah. And you shall have no other Elohim before my face. Well, I don't worship any other Elohims, right? I don't do that. It might be you. You might be the Elohim. You may have raised yourself up into a position of, I know what's best for me. I know what I'm going to do. And it doesn't correlate with what Father is saying. It doesn't match up. You may be the Elohim. Anything can be an Elohim. Football, soccer. I did, you know, we're multinational here, so I had to say soccer as well. Well, that's football. That makes more sense to me why that's football. <laughs> that that sounds really because they use their feet. But anyway, yes, I did say they. Um, so, you know, whatever it is that is your idol, don't have it before his face. This is a married contract. This is your husband. He don't want no other man, no other husband before his face. Those who want to be married, those who are married, do you want another person before your face that your mate is looking at, enjoying, laughing with? No, you don't. So this just makes common sense, honestly. Two, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in the heavens above or the earth uh, beneath or, the, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, I'm a jealous Elohim, pushing the, pushing, punishing the children uh, for the sins of the Father to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. This is serious business. This is real serious business. If you, if you just, see, you just can't have offspring. Father goes, but if you don't behave, your offspring will be, will suffer for it as well. So do it for them. You're not going to do it for me. Do it for them. Have you ever tried to get somebody to do what was right for them and they won't do it for themselves, they won't do it for you, and you find some do for the cat. They love the cat. So do it for the cat then. Oh, okay, I'll do it for the cat. See, Father, Father is saying whatever it takes, because most people love their children. Most people don't want their children hurt, especially from something they did. They don't want that to fall on their children. They're responsible for it. So Father will use whatever is necessary. And it's too bad he has to do that. That's how wicked we are. That's a reflection of what we are, that he has to go that far. He's not bad. We're bad. But there's a contrast showing love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commands. So it's really simple. We got to make, we got choices to make. Either we're going to keep his commands and be Baruch, Baruch or we're going to keep his commands and be Baruch <laughs> Which in Hebrew, the word for curse is also blessing because it's still going to come. It's going to be the opposite, but it's the same thing. Three, you shall not cast Nassah, send the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin. Shoah, destruction, for Yahuwah will not hold anyone guiltless who casts his name to ruin that also is wide open uh unfortunately uh, babylon has projected this thing don't cuss with his name in it they don't even know his name so they ain't been doing that anyway and that's not in full what it means yes do not use his name as a cuss word yes i agree with that but that's not the fullness y'all ready to go deep let's go deep into this well and you guys, some of you have heard me say this before. For those new ones, this will be new to you. It's about our, the name that we were taking on our father's name. Just like children and a wife takes on the husband's name, the father's name. And if the wife or children go out into society and act a fool in ways that would not bring honor and glory to that name, then you're bringing the name to ruin in the Hebrew way of thinking. You're destroying the family name. I've known of people, and I know people, who have done that and who are doing that to their family name. See, back then, they didn't go by, there was no such thing as 
you you're black you're white and everybody judged you by a color they didn't talk like that they judged you by how you acted how did you act oh you're from this family this family are a bunch of thieves and liars so their name was brought to destruction amongst those who knew that name i'm just going to pull a name out i'm not that I, i'm not saying anybody with this name is this but the conroy boys you know, you hear about them. They're always causing trouble and doing stuff. And, you know, they're bringing shame to their parents. And this is what we do when we say that we are called by his name. We're children of Elohim. We go around ministering, wearing tzitzis and uh, uh, not doing Christmas and all this stuff. That's just part of it. What's the rest of it? Our behavior. How are we behaving? Are we loving? Are we kind? Are we charitable? Are we patient? Do we reach out to people or is everything about us? Are we so focused on me, 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 and you're not even trying to sing? That, that's what Father is talking about. Don't bring his name to destruction. Four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it Kodesh. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Six days we are to work as Hebrews. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yehoi Elohim, as I've said before, you may say, well, my job don't allow me. That's overtime. Wonderful. Wash some clothes. Clean the house. Cook. Massage your husband's feet. Massage your wife's feet. Do something. Get in the garden. Cut the grass. Trim, tr trim the edges. There's, all, there's work to clean the garage. Clean that little storage place or, or storage place you have. It needs to be cleaned out. You've been talking about it. This is obedience to his word. It says, we, we, six days you shall labor. You shall. That's a commandment. And all and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Shabbat to Yahuwah, your Elohim. I thought it was for them Jews. That's what I heard so much. But it says here it's to Yahuwah. <laughs> but I thought it was for them Jews. It was to them. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maid servant, nor your animal, nor your alien within your gates. If you have guests over, friends, family, whoever, somebody said, hey, somebody needs a couch to sleep on, and you open your doors up to do that because you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you don't want them out in the cold like that, they have to do. There's some, you better speak to them. We don't do X, Y, and Z. There's no pork in the house if they're not a believer. You can't bring no pork in here. You can't bring alcohol, cigarettes. Not even leftover cigarettes. You can't bring nothing like that. Uh, that's an insight joke. Um, and uh, uh, and they have to honor the Sabbath. Now, my sister, when I would go see my sister in San Diego, I would let her know if it fell on the Shabbat, I can't do anything. I can't do this, that, and the other. You know, and she would prepare. So she had been practicing the Shabbat for 15 years. Well, now she's in the faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because I didn't, I didn't compromise. I did not compromise. For in six days, Yahuwah made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, because of that, Yahuwah blessed the seventh, Sabbath day and made it set apart Kodesh. He set it apart. See, when we don't practice the seventh day Sabbath, we're not reestablishing what happened in Bereshit, that, there, that Yahuwah created the world, through his word, as we know now, the living embodiment of Yahusha, Yahuwah's deliverance. When we do the first day, we're doing something that he has not instructed us to do, nor is it anywhere in scripture. The Catholic Church will tell you they created it. There's no scriptural uh, reason why, even though there are some denominations that have made up some interesting reasons to why, and it doesn't fit, it doesn't work. No work. We just need to obey what's here. We, we don't have to reinvent the will. We don't have to reinvent scripture. It is perfect just the way it is. Five, honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land Yahuwah, your Elohim is giving you. Again, I talk about this. You, you, you ones who have been with us already know this. Those who are new. This is more for them, but it's reestablishing it in you so that you are able to speak on this to others. 
He knew we were going to be in the dispersion. He already knew this when he spoke these words. And he wrote them down and gave them to Moshe. He knew this. Yes, in context, at this particular time, he's speaking to Yisrael and Yasharal. And what's happening? They're, they're, they're making their way to the promised land. For us, what does it mean today? Did he, he knew I was going to be here in the United States, in California eventually, and, and what was going to take place. Am I to honor, am I not to honor my father and mother because I'm not in Yisrael? Does that even make sense? So that's done away with now. I don't have to do that. No, of course not. I'm still Yisrael. And so wherever I am, Yisrael is. Right? So wherever land that he's placed me, I will live long and prosper there. Let, let me not add, you will live long in the land. I'll just leave it at that. Let's not add or take away, right? So I will live long. Uh, and, and to me, prosper, to live long is prospering. So let's continue to do that. Let's not be fooled and, and, and believe the lie. Six, you shall not murder. Two words, low rasak, no kill. There's a murderous spirit out in this world. Everybody wants to kill each other for whatever reasons. It's permeate down to the children. Playing video games and somebody gets beat on a video game want to pull out a gun and kill his brother. And did. Boy in New York. Father shouldn't have had the gun there in the first place. He shouldn't have known it was there. But unbelievable. Over a video game. These things promote violence. They build up. It's demonic entities that are, that are uh, on these things, that come through these things, and will sit on them. I know a Christian man who his son, and I know his son. This is years ago. That's still in Christianity. It just came to mind. He was playing some uh, um, superhero one um, that had just come out. And his son literally started uh, speaking in a tongue that he did not know. And he said, sound demonic. And he said it was after hiding and playing this game. So he was in disobedience to his father. His father told him not to. And he had been playing it for a couple months. And he started to see the change in his son's attitude and the way he was responding. And he said, my son was possessed. He, he, that's what he said. So stay away from these things. Because these things will bring demons to you. They're designed to do so. It's not just for entertainment. Well, it is for entertainment, actually. Not the way you think. Because then you got to break down the word enter. What's entering you? To detain, entertain, meant. Something's entering you to hold on to you. What is it? See, these are questions we don't ask. Especially when something is, 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 seems to be good and fun and, and it feels right. What is it really doing? See, Satan will do that. Satan will do that. Seven, you shall not break wedlock. Two words. Lo naaf, lo, lu naaf, lu naaf. That's how the King James Version of the Scriptures was born. Through this rebellion of breaking wedlock. King James wanted to break wedlock. The Pope at the time said no. Because it says you cannot break wedlock. I can't sanction that. Wow. Well, good for the Pope, that Pope. He said, oh, well, whatever then. I'm going to get this other woman. I'm, I want to marry her. I'm divorcing this woman, so I'll make my own scriptures. So those of you who are staunched on that the King James Version is it, well, just to let you know, it, it came out of rebellion, and the scriptures tell me that rebellion is as of witchcraft. It's demonic. It's divination. So I'll leave you with that. Number eight. You should not steal. Two words. Lo, naab, lo, naab, no steal. Again, as I say almost every week, you guys are probably tired of it, but these are for the new ones. We all know about the small stuff. Don't, you know, or the big stuff, I mean, but the small stuff, sometimes we miss. We take some extra ketchup. Oh, we're running low at home. Some extra sauces. I'm guilty of that. Oh, I've been guilty of that for years. I'm not no more. I'll ask. All you got to do is do a simple thing. Hey, um, can I take 10 of these? And if they say yes, that's not stealing. If you go ahead and take more than what you need, and you didn't ask, stealing. Take what you need only. But if you ask and they say yes, that's not stealing. Nine, you should not give false testimony against your neighbor. Okay, I think we know that one. Don't lie. Don't, don't. 
don't do that. You, uh, do I need to, I hope I don't have to explain that one. 10. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife <laughs> or his manservant. You know, and that's for you ladies too. Don't be coveting husbands as well. Because women out there, you got a good husband, work every day. He look good. He takes care of his body. He's good to his wife and a kid. And, they, and here you are with all the bad decisions you made and bad men you've been with. And you start looking for him. You know what I'm going to say? You need to covet Yahuwah. And get with him. And he'll make you a good woman. So that you will get a good man. Sometimes we think we're ready for a good man. We ain't a good mate. And I'm just talking about women and the men too. So we're both sides. That we pray the wrong prayer. Oh send me a mate. I need a mate. Maybe you need to get right first. So that you can be a good mate. See, it's always about what we want. I don't hear a lot about what people are going to give in a marriage. They want to be married because they need this. They need comfort. They need sex. They need uh, another income into, the, into their life. They need a sounding board. They need somebody to walk on the beach with a moonlit night with. Well, what are you going to do? See, both sides should be going, I'm a, I want to be married so I can take care of a wife and be good to her and give her all she needs and be Yahusha in her life. I'm going to marry a man so I can bring forth children for him, cook and clean for him, and, and, and be there when he needs. I'll be his helpmate like the Yahuwah, or excuse me, Haua was supposed to be. See, we're all selfish in our desires. It's about me, me, me. What am I going to get out of it? As soon as you start thinking that way, it's doomed from the beginning. From the very start. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The secret of Yahuwah is with those who fear him. Do you fear? Uh, another word that can be put there is reverence. Do you respect? Do you hold him up? Well, if you do, this is for you. And he makes his covenant known to them. Tehillim 25.14 so let's see what happens here in Coelith. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 through 14. This is slow-mo Solomon. Wisest man, father, gifted him with the ability to be wiser than any man at that time. Because he asked for it as a young 16-year-old boy. He said, give me wisdom so I can take care of your people. That was beautiful. He was being so. He could ask for anything. Father said, ask for anything, I'll give it to you. And because he asked for the right thing. He was unselfish. The first two commandments, he was loving Father with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. He was loving others first. He put himself on a back burner. He wanted something, a tool, so that he could rule pr properly. So he wanted to be the best servant he could be for Yahuwah and for the people. Different mindset. Different mindset. Father said, Boy, I, I'm going to give you everything now that you said that. We pray wrong a lot. We, we can learn something from the beginning of slow-mo. And we can also learn it's not how you start, it's how you finish. You have to endure to the end. He, he kind of fell off. But this is while he was good. So let's read what he concluded as he searched out life at his time and looked at everything. Let's hear the conclusion of the entire matter. Fear, Elohim. And guard his commands, for it is for them Jews. Well, he couldn't even say Jew because the word wasn't even there. He wouldn't even have said that. <laughs> he, he didn't know, nobody knew that word, Jew. There was no such thing. There was no such people. It is called Jewish people. So when people say that, it, 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 it's ignorance. And I don't say that in a mean way. I'm ignorant to a lot of things. We're all ignorant to tons of stuff. Too much information in this world, too much uh, uh, things, you know, that to know about. So we're all ignorant to, to a huge degree on a lot of matters, and that's okay. But these who do this, they're, they're ignorant. They don't know the history. They don't know who's who, and they haven't been taught that, and they're trusting these, um, well, parlor trick uh, 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 <laughs> um, pastors and bishops and stuff. 
and and they just do a puff of this. But I was in a congregation one time, Christian Christianity. I never believed like, they were going. They couldn't. They ran out of. Excuse me for mumbling a little bit because my thoughts are going everywhere. They they they, they had benevolence had ran out. But they had money for a fog machine and, and the and the fluid that you put in it. So during uh, praise and thanksgiving, they can make it look like the Holy Spirit rolled in. They actually said that. Well, why are we trying to make it be something it's not? Either the Ruach is here or not. You're going to fabric, fabricate that? You're going to make it up? You're going to fake it? So people, without, what is that? That's lying. Is that not lying? I wouldn't listen to people who lying to me like that. That's why I'm not there anymore. That's why, and I wouldn't be part of anything that they touch until they repent it, and they have not. At least as far as I'm aware. For it applies to all mankind. What applies? Fear of Elohim and guarding His commandments. They apply to all mankind. For Elohim shall bring every work, not some, every, not half of yours. Every, yeah, your neighbor too, every work into right rule, including all that is hidden. There is nothing hidden to him. He's going to judge it all. Whether good, dysfunctional, or whether evil. Dysfunctional. I think he said dysfunctional twice by accident. Whether good, functional, I think I did, thank you. <laughs> or whether dysfunctional, evil. Yeah. Thank you for that correction. So we're going to get into the meat of this service. Why is it important to know y'all's calendar? Part three. This is going to be a little deeper. Last week was a little lighter just to give you a little reprieve so that you can take in some more of the previous one because you need to to get it. Scriptural foundation for how Yahuwah told us how to tell time. You know, I brought up last week or and, and the week before probably that I remember my mom when she was teaching me and she would, we, we would look up at, at the clock that was on the wall and she would go, what time is it? She explained to me each part of the clock, not the inner, the outer. Um, I, I got curious as a kid and then started taking watches apart. Down or, down or up? Down? Um, I started taking watches apart because then once I learned how to tell time, I was like, how does this thing work? And my mom wasn't too happy about a couple watches I had taken apart. But I put them back together. And they worked. So, in today's teaching, we will be going over these points. Calculating the first month. The new moon, what they call the new moon of the year. Very important. Because there's confusion over that. What is um, the first month of the year? What is the true new year? Now, the Jewish people... Tell you is Rosh Hashanah. But that's in the seventh month. So how can that be? Seventh month first. Oh, well, it's okay to have two new years. See, that's confusion. And I've heard people say that. And it's people and teachers. Why is that okay? How come there's two new years? That doesn't make sense. That is a stubborn, rebellious spirit that's unwilling to follow the truth of the word that's changing the word and being religious and man-made traditions, which Yahusha said that you make so many of these man-made traditions, or you make them, I added so many, but you make these man-made traditions that null and void, what? The commandments of Yahuwah. Are we a people that want to make null and void the commandments of Yahuwah? Are, 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 are we that type of people, or do we want to follow and obey his, his word as we said we would? See, he took us out of Misraim, out of the land of slavery, right? That's what he, so he took us out of bondage to clean us up. Why are we still trying to put our foot back in the mud? You ever see, you, you ever see a dog? Oh, I had my dog, man. Oh, wash that dog, and that dog would run and rub his nose in the dirt, and I just cleaned the dog. What are you doing? <laughs> hated that oh, that's just got dirty rubbing his nose and his whole body in the dirt well I think we do that to father a lot he gets us to a place of cleanliness and we jump back in the mud and he's going okay let's go over this again 
calculating the first day of the month, the crescent and the conjunction moon, the conjunction position, everything begins in what? Darkness. Darkness. Why is this all important? Because there's so many things out there that's telling us other things than what Scripture is saying. There are a lot of people following some some interesting things that's not of Scripture. And there's people bending and twisting Scripture to try to make these things sound right. And if it doesn't, then they go to outer books. To say this is what it is and this is what it should be. We talked about the book of Anak, Enoch, or Hanuk, depending on how you like to pronounce it. And... If you we, we went over that and pretty much I think we put the nail in the coffin. I, I hope we did. You know, these are observances that he observed. Didn't say these are commandments. This is how you tell time. Didn't say that it was observance. Then the world changed after the flood. And we live in a different world than what they lived then. I also proved that there were earthquakes that shifted the access and took away time last week. I also showed in scripture where time was taken away as well with Yahusha, the son of son, the uh, um, the assistant of Moshi when he was in that battle and he commanded the son to sit still and father listened to a man. And that son stayed in his place for a day. So there was some time lost there as well. So everything is different. So we can't go by that book. That was a different time frame. And it was never said that those were commandments. And there's a couple of things off. Because it said a couple of things would be eternal and they're not. They don't happen today. So we have to look into those things. We just can't get onto these. You know, there's so many teachers out there. You know, when they turn off the internet on us, I'm not going to be too sad about it. In one way, yes, and in another way, no. Yeah, I won't be sitting here and, and f fellowshipping with you like we are today and doing these teachings. But I know Father is going to take care of all of us, and that's okay. But there's so much garbage. There's so much refuge on the Internet that people are, are buying into and sucking, you know, and saying this is the truth, and they're really not studying. They're really they're, they're studying video after video after video. Have you got your hands into a book? Or or did you go to a website yourself? I'm talking about and I'm talking about one where somebody says this and I'm talking about at a site where the information is like uh a Encyclopedia Britannica that has some information in there. If you want to know if the word G O D is appropriate and where that word comes from, it'll tell you. It says it's from the tectonic people of Europe. And as they were being forced converted, they were bringing their own language, what they already knew, and the Catholic Church was okay with that. Just be a Catholic. We don't care what you call Elohim. Call him what you want. You won't call him G-O-D, we're good with that. Matter of fact, we'll do it too. And they do many such things like that. Holy water. Where does that come from? That's from, that, that's from Hinduism. Out of the Ganges River. It had nothing to do with scripture. See, we got to be careful. We got to research and we got to go into history. Put down YouTube for a minute. Put down the shows that you're looking at just for a moment. So that you don't come to somebody who is knowledgeable and who desires to know full truth and then tell them they're wrong. And, and if you don't mind me saying this, and you probably will, and being an idiot and being a foolish idiot at that point. Because you really don't know. Because you haven't studied it out yourself. Study it out yourself. It was the scripture say, study to show yourself approved. See, we we in scripture, Father tells us that we, we will heap up teachers that will tickle our ears. And we we'll, we love it. We don't have no problem giving them lots of money. The ones that make us feel good and smile all the time. And who was never mad at you. He just loves you. Anything and everything you do is okay with him. He said his son. Everything is great. Does you who will love you? Absolutely. Like any parent though. Or if you have friends. If your friends is kicking your car door in. 
and does it every time they walk by your car and you say, hey, stop that. What are you doing? Are you going to be, oh, I just love my friend. He's, he's in good standing with me. No, that's not going to happen. Okay, so calculating the first month of the year. How do we do that? Did Father give us some instructions to his children? Did he just leave us out there? It's not a big deal. Just tell time the way you want to. Any way you see fit. Is there a reason why we need to know? Does he have his own timeline on how he's going to be doing certain things that we need to be aware of? That's only going to happen in his timeline, not any other calendar. Not the Jewish calendar, not the Julianan calendar, not the Gregorian calendar. There's no calendar Father is going to go by except for his own. So is it important for his people to know his calendar and the prophetic timeline in which it, it uh, his prophecies that will follow that prophetic timeline? Absolutely. So it's important. Last Sabbath service, we covered the Anuk or Enoch calendar and showed how 364 days a year cannot be 365 days a year. <laughs> I think maybe it's simple math. We, we, we will today discuss the Anuk Enoch calendar more. When it comes to determining the first day of the month. There are two remaining schools of thought as it relates on what mechanism primarily determines the start of the year. The agricultural sign called Abib, the Karite calendar, and the heavenly signs of the stars of the stars, heaven, and earth calendar, as we talked about last week as well. Shamut Exodus 12, 1 through 2. And Yahuwah spoke to Musa and to Aharon in the land of Mitzrayim, saying, This new moon is the beginning of new moons for you. It is the first new moon of the year for you. Kind of simple, is it not? It is then revealed to us that the month of Pesach, Passover, is the first month of the year. Let's read Samuth, Exodus 13, 3 through 4. And Musa said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Mitzrayim, out of the house of slavery. For by strength of hand, Yahuwah brought you out of this place. And whatever is leavened shall not be eaten. Today, you are going out in the new month of Bib. Fairly simple. Kind of point blank. Uh, I don't I, see. I know Satan comes in and does some stuff because he causes confusion. How is this confusing? Pretty simple. Shemot Exodus twenty three fifteen. Guard the festival of Mazut. Seven days you eat unleavened bread, and I command you at the time appointed in the new moon of Abib. For in it you can you came out Miss Rain and do not appear before me empty handed. So here we got another guideline. Now we know that unleavened bread is in the month of Abib as well, and we know something that Abib is on the same day as Pesach. It's still part of the same day. Somebody's thinking hard right now. One's the 14th, one's the 15th. One starts at what? Sundown. Sundown, and one is before that sundown. They're on the same day, even though they're separate days. The way we look at things. The way we look at things. Shemot, Exodus thirty-four, eighteen. Guard the festival of Mazut. For seven days you, you eat unleavened bread. As I command you in the appointed time of the new moon of a bee. Well, giving you some pretty direct, you know, information here. Because in the new because in the new moon of a bee, you came out from Mitzrayim. See, so Mitzrayim is, is is crucial. Mitzrayim is crucial to this. When did they come out? That's a bee. That's the first month. In the verse we just looked at, it should be clear. That in, can, uh, in, uh, 
clear that in connection with the first month of the year, the Pesach, Passover month, um, the Passover month, we see it also being called the month of Abib. Abib in the case, a stage in the development of the barley crops. This can be understood by reading Shemot, Exodus 9, 31 through 32, which describes the devastation caused by the plague of hell on Mitzrayim because of Pharaoh's rebellion, his witchcraft. Abib indicates a stage in the development of the barley crops. So we're going to learn about some agriculture. Just a little bit. See, we got to learn these things, and it's okay. We're learning more. If you love Father and you want to know his ways, you should go, oh, well, I don't care about that. Don't, with somebody you love, don't you care about every aspect of their life? What do they like to eat? Oh, what type of flowers do they like? What kind of food do they like? Did I already say that? What kind of food they Yeah, I did. What kind of clothes do they like? You know? And you, you want to, what's their favorite color? Where were they born? What's their ethnic background? All these things you want to know somebody. So when you want to know somebody, you want to know all the information. When you're in love, when you're in love. This can be understood by reading Shemot, Exodus 9, 31, 32, which describes the devastation caused by the plague of hell. Let's read. And the flax and the barley were struck. For the barley was in the head and the flax was in the bud. Gibul. But the wheat and the split was not struck, for they were not, they were late, dark, alfilut crops. Now we're going to talk about that. These verses relates, relates that the barley crop were destroyed by hell while the wheat and split were not damaged. To understand the reason for this, we must look at how grain develops. We are going to learn some agriculture of how the life cycle of grain works, of grains work. With grains, or barley in particular, um, when grains are early in their development, they are flexible and they have dark green, they are a dark green color. As they become ripe, they take on a light yellowish hue and become more brittle. The reason that the barley was destroyed and the wheat was not is that the barley had reached the stage in its development called a bee, and as a result had become brittle enough to be damaged by the hell. The description of the wheat and the split as dark afalut indicates that they were still in the stage when they were deep green and had not yet begun to lighten into the light yellowish hue which Catholic Characterize, char characterizes ripe grains. Excuse me, my, my tongue stuck. In contrast, the barley had reached the stage of a beeb at which time it was no longer dark. And, it, and at this point, it probably had begun to develop golden streaks. We know from several passages that barley, which is in the state of a bee, has not completely ripened, but has ripened enough so that its seeds can be eaten perched in fire. Perched barley was a common eaten food in ancient Israel and is mentioned in numerous passages in the scriptures as either a bee perched, called ua. Ka'u'ai, or in fire, you find that in uh, uh, Leviticus 2.14, or in the abbreviated for, uh, form, perched, Ka'u'ai, or Ka'u'ai, which you find in 23.14 as well, Yahusha, or Joshua 5.11, Samuel, Aleph, 17.70, um, Samuel, Aleph, 25.28, and Samuel, Bat, 17.28, Ruth, to chapter 2 verse 14 while still early in its development I, I didn't read all these out only because i have a tons of slides right now and it would have been a lot more so you guys can look those up yourself on your own time and have any questions please come back to us 
uh, contact us. While still early in development, Barley has not yet produced large enough, uh, has not produced large enough and firm enough seeds to produce food through perching. This, this early in its development, when the head has just come out of the shaft, the seeds are not sustainable enough to produce any food. At a later stage, the seed has grown in size and has filled with liquid. That's interesting. That little thing, there's liquid in it. And at, at this point, the seeds will uh, shrivel up when perched and will only produce empty skins. Over time, the liquid is replaced with dry material, and when enough dry material has amassed, the seeds will be able to yield barley perched in fire. Now, isn't that something? Some of you who are more advanced, do you are you getting some connections here? How do you you have to let the barley develop to a place to where then you can do what? Perch it by what? Fire. Doesn't that sound like our walk a little bit? Funny how nature will show you what Father's talking about about our walk. If, we, if, if he does it too early, it's not no, no good. But he does it when we're right, and we get perched by that fire, then we produce a fruit. Don't be scared of the fire. Just make sure that Father's not going to put you in the fire before your time. Um... Uh, Barley perch by fire. The month of Abib is the month which commences after the barley has reached the stage of Abib. Two or three weeks after the beginning of the month, the barley has moved beyond the stage of Abib and is ready to be brought as a wave sheaf offering. Ha nafat, ha yamar. The wave offering, excuse me, the wave sheaf offering is a sacrifice bought from the first stalks cut in the harvest and is brought on the first day of the week, the pagan name there, which falls out during uh which falls out during unleavened bread, Hag Hamazot. Let's go to Yaragra 23, 10 through 11. And Yahuwah spoke to Musa, saying, Speak to the children of Yisrael, Yasharal, and you shall say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, you shall reap its harvest. Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before Yahuwah for your acceptance. On the morrow, after the Sabbath, the priest waves it. There's a little time frame there on the morrow after, right? From this, from this is a clear, it is clear, excuse me, from this it is clear that the barley, which was a bee, at the beginning of the month has become harvest, ready about the 14th to 21st days after or later. Now we know that what do we know about the 14th day in the bee? What happens? Pesach. Interesting. See all these connections. Therefore, when the first month of the year begins, we should also see that the barley has reached a stage where it will be harvested, ready, two or three weeks, weeks later. The understanding that some of the barley will be harvested, ready, two or three weeks into the month of Abib is also clear from Debraim 16.9, which states, Count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. From Yagra 25.15, we, we know that the seven weeks between unleavened bread and Shavuot, Pentecost, as they call it in the Greek, Begin on the day when the wave sheaf offering is brought. Let's read that. Now you shall count from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day you bring the sheaf for waving, they will be seven complete Sabbaths. 
it shall be it should be noted that not all the barley ripens in the land of Yasharal at the same time. This is often a common concern for many. Does all the barley need to be ripe by the time of first fruits? The answer is no, and I will explain shortly. Don't don't fret. Does a bee barley need to be found in Jerusalem only? Or can it be anywhere in the land? The answer again is no. It can be found anywhere in the land, and I hopefully will clarify that as well. Because these questions are asked so often, this is an important section to pay attention to. This causes a lot of dissension. This causes a lot of uh, infighting disagreements and such and actually it's really simple you know when you have these types of discussions and arguments and you cannot get to an agreement on scripture scripture tells me all foul spirits are present so for those of you who have been in these type of conversations just remove yourself R remove yourself and go to scripture and follow what scripture says. Not them Jews. Not me. Not, follow what scripture says to do. That's where you're safe. It is not. It is not important where in the land the barley originates. The reason should make sense. Everyone in the land is to bring the first fruits of barley into Jerusalem. So it does not matter where in the land it comes from. Father did not say... And he has said, only this spot you can do sacrifices. Only in this spot the temple can be where I place my name. See, where could the temple only be back then? The physical building. Does anybody know? Anybody in here? Any, any of you guys? Where could the temple only be? Oh, you guys don't know? Where the temple could only be? Uh, Jerusalem. Thank you, Jerusalem. It's the only place it could be. So if Father is so particular about certain things and he leaves out other stuff, if he left it out nine times out of ten, that means not a concern. Get it where you can get it from and bring it in. The instruction of the first fruit is for Yasharal to assemble in Jerusalem and Jerusalem and to bring their first fruits of the barley harvest in. Usually the bee barley will be found in the Jordan Valley first because it has a slightly warmer climate than the hills. That makes just sense. Thus, it also makes sense then that the barley in the Jordan Valley would also likely ripen first. Doesn't that just make sense? See, this, this stuff actually isn't really that difficult if you really just read scripture. The first fruits of the barley in the valley also need to be brought to Jerusalem for first fruits. And if other fields are not yet harvested, harvest ready, it is certain that some of the barley in, in the slightly warmer areas would be. So again, go get it where it is. For the first fruit offering, it is acceptable to have some barley harvest ready and some barley still in the stage of a beat. The wave sheaf offering is a national sacrifice. I'm going to read that again. The wave sheaf offering is a national sacrifice. You know, like we have national holidays. Everybody gets off. We just had, uh, what was it, Martin Luther King. You know, everybody got off, for those who did. So this is a national sacrifice brought from the first fields to become harvest ready. However... The first fruit offering brought by individual farmers can vary in ripeness anywhere from a bee perched in fire to fully ripe grain, which may be brought crushed or coarsely ground. Thus, not all of the barley needs to be ripe. Now, see, a lot of people say that the, the, the rules, the regulations, the law is so harsh, yet I see flexibility everywhere I read. This is why we can't go by what man says. We have to go and read scripture and find out the personality of our Heavenly Father ourselves. Is that true what these people are saying about the Creator? Is it true? Find out for yourself. 
You know, it's like, have you ever been in this situation? I have. So-and-so doesn't like so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so comes to you. Let's just say it's a co-worker and says, I have issues with this particular co-worker. Blah, 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 blah. Right, and they're kind of trying to make you be on their side. They're, they're trying to turn you around a little bit so you'll be with them and be against this other person. And I always said, well, that's between you two. We get, we get along fine. I get along with you. I get along with this person. That's between you two. Because that person's good with me. See, we need to not just take other people's word for how father his what his what his personality is. What does scripture say his personality? What did he write about himself? And we go with that. And then you experience him in that vein and go, Oh, I knew he was gonna do that. You you'll get to do that. Don't you do that with people? I know if I say this, they're gonna respond this way. Up, oh, see. Oh, I know they don't like chocolate. They like peanut butter. Oh, I know they don't like peanut butter. They like chocolate. I know they like to eat hamburgers a lot. Jeanette was here. She'd be giggling right now. Her two favorite things, because I know her. I've been knowing her a long time. She likes hamburgers and tacos. In any order that comes in, if there was a hamburger taco, she'd probably pass out. After she ate it. <laughs> She wouldn't pass out before. So, we need to get to know our Heavenly Father and how He is. Not, and not go along with what other people say. However, the first fruit offering bought by an individual farmer can vary. I already read that. Uh, this is what is meant in your Agra uh, 2.14. And if you bring a grain offering of your first fruits to Yahuwah, bring... For the grain offering of your first fruits, green heads of green roasted on the fire, of grain roasted on the fire, crushed heads of new grain. A direct translation of 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 Yagra from the Hebrew. You guys ready for this? And when you bring a first fruit offering to Yahuwah, you shall bring your first fruit offering as a beeb perched in fire or crushed caramel that caught my attention because i love caramel so i said oh, car caramel okay caramel is a grain which has hardened beyond a bead to a point where it came to be crushed or coarse coarsely ground that's not the caramel i was looking for but hey all right i learned something new all of these passages have been translated directly from the hebrew and it is worth noting that the King James translators seem to have a very poor understanding of various Hebrew agricultural terms. The purpose of that book, that version of scripture, was only for a rebellious reason. It was to rewrite some things. It wasn't for full understanding. And Yagra, uh, they translate 214, they translate karma as full ears and Abib as green ears, whereas Yagra 2314, they translate caramel as green ears. Barley, which is in the state of a beef, has three characteristics. One, it is brittle enough to be destroyed by hell and has begun to lighten in color and it is not dark. Two, the seeds have produced enough dry material so it, uh, so it can be eaten, perched. Three, it has developed enough so that it will it will be harvested ready two or three weeks later. Pastor, what does it all got to do with figuring out when the first month is of the year? Hang in there with me. But we got to go through this route. There are witnesses of barley being a bee as early as March 7th in 2006 and March 8th in 2005, which is not at all... That uncommon in Yisrael, Yasharal. The Abib barley can be ripe as early as March 21st. If Abib barley is found anywhere in the land two or three weeks prior to first fruits, then that means that there will most certainly be ripe barley um, beginning of uh, being brought to the temple that could be used for the way sheep offering. Most certainly. Not all of the barley will be ripe, nor does it have to be, as we just reasoned out according to 
the scripture we just read, Uriagra 2.14. Typically, though, all barley is harvested by the end of April. If not sooner, and then the wheat harvest begins. So the abee barley is an agricultural sign pointing us to the first month of the year is to be determined. If you have been paying attention, I hope you have. The question that should be forming in your mind is this. How is a sign of barley, a sign from the lights in the sky mentioned in Bereshit Genesis chapter 1? Good question, Brother Aiden. That's, that, that, that's a Brother Aiden question. That's why I put that there. In a literal sense, it is not. In reality, it is more of a cause and effect. Let me explain. The lights in the sky cause spring to occur, and the barley begin a beep is a result of spring arriving. Do you see how that works? It is no different than saying, in the season of spring, there are flowers, but the flowers do not cause spring. It would be sort of silly to say that the flowers cause spring. Instead, the flowers are a sign of spring. Now, we had a little quick heat wave last week, in the week, uh, maybe a little bit the week before. And I'm going to tell you, I thought a lot of stuff, the, the spring stuff had disappeared on my flowers and stuff. <laughs> they, they popped up during that heat. They thought it was spring. They started to pop up and out. I went, whoa. Wait a minute, these aren't due yet. Because I'm I'm into gardening, so a lot of this made sense to me. It is the night it is the nature of the position of Earth as it relates to the sun and stars that dictates the arrival of flowers in the spring. We can look up to the sun and stars and know that spring is here as the first witness. That's key. And then look down to see the flowers on the earth as the second witness. We are not looking for flowers as an earthly witness. We are looking for a bee barley. The bee barley functions in the same way as the example with the flowers. The bee barley does not cause or declare that the first month has arrived. It is the result of the first month, first month arriving. I hope that makes sense. We cannot ignore that the stars are to be used in assisting in calculating the appointed times as Bereshit chapter 1 clearly declares. However, we also cannot imagine that Yahuwah also stated that we should see the Abib in the first month of the year if we use the stars correctly. The stars are the heavenly sign. And the abib barley is the earthly agricultural sign. You know, we, we're going to get into two or more witnesses. You're going to see it everywhere. The stars are the heavenly sign. Oh, that. The stars are the greater sign, and the earth is the lesser sign. Because heavenly always trumps the earthly. The heavens are higher than the earth. Yeshaya. Isaiah 55 9. Thus, the scriptural model should then use the stars to determine the first month and validate our calculation through the witness of the Abib. Matthew Manyahu 8 16. But if he does not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word might be established. That's the principle. You're going to find, here are some more scriptures to witness to this Elohimli principles. So, Yohanan, John 8, 17, 2 Corinthians 13, 1, Demotheus, Allah, 1 Timothy 5, 19, and I bring Hebrews 10, 28. I'm going to leave that up there while I take a little sip for those who want to write that down. You're going to notice I'm going to do that a couple of times um, throughout this teaching. Because there's some information that I, I know you're not going to be able to write down so swiftly. Oh, they can't see the screen, can they? No, it's full screen. 
Oh, oh, they can see it. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Go ahead. I put it back. If we are going to render a judgment on a matter, we need two or three witnesses. If we do not see there be barley in the month that the stars declare the first month to arrive, then we have a problem. We can't make a valid judgment on it. What this means is that the stars should always agree with the Abib, and the Abib should always agree with the stars. Hopefully, that is starting to make sense to you. The earthly sign of Abib barley is the result of the lights in the heavens to be where they are supposed to be. Meaning this, it is the lights in the heavens that determine the timing. And the Abib barley is simply the result of of that very timing. It's verifying that is the time. The Abib barley. The Abib barley is the result of spring and not the cause of it. So if you, nobody's going to look at the, the uh, Abib harvest or barley and go, oh, spring is here. They're, gonna, they're expecting it. Well, you get it. All right. Therefore, both signs are correct and both point to the first month of the year. There should be no debate between the two. So it's not one or the other, it's both. One is confirming the other. The stars, the moon, uh, uh, the sun are all in a certain position. You can look up and see it, and then you go, okay, am I right about this? And then you look to the earth, and you see the abar uh, uh, the abib, the barley is, is, is ripening, and you go, okay, we're good to go. They are both true, just like... The Torah, what they call the law, and mercy, which they call grace, are both truths. But obviously we should not pit them against each other, which has been done, has it not? Is either the law or grace, yeah. when it's both, it's a marriage. The frustrating aspect of the equinox and barley debate is that there should be no debate. Most of you guys know how I feel about debating. It is a, it, it's wickedness, it's fighting. It is what it is. The definition is there. I don't care how you shake that around to make it fit your comfortability and your willingness to continue in it. It's fighting. Just a second. We're alive again. Okay. Thank you for sharing with us, or, or however we found out that the mic was staticky. I listened on that. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Also, someone commented, thank you. Oh. So thank you, whoever commented. Um, I was talking about debating at that moment, you know, debating is fighting. People are comfortable with debating. They want to fight because there's a fighting spirit in this world. I am not going to fight with anybody. It's going to be reasoning through the scriptures and let father, you're going to fight with father because I'm not going to fight with him. Um, but you can, but definitely look these things up and let's do this in peace. Let's be shalom. Let's have shalom with one another. And, and, and let's love one another. And let's not debate. The word debate means fighting. I've had people who think they're wise rebuke or, or, or not follow what the dictionary definition is. I'm not going to believe that. I don't want to. But here's the dictionary. I don't care. There's other definitions too. But this one goes all the way back to the end. Uh, I, oh, it's in scripture. There's debating in scripture. Yes, there is debating in scripture, and usually was was wicked people debating. And if they were debate, I'll tell you, the disciples were debating about who was going to be the greatest. Do you think they were in a moment of wickedness while they were doing that? Was Yahusha pleased with their debating over who was going to be the greatest? See, no, it, it, I'm gonna move on from that. Uh, it is just the uh, that the stars. Let me read all of it. The frustrating aspect of the equinox and barley debate is that there should be no debate. Both methods should produce the exact same result. It is just that the stars are more valuable because, unlike the earthly sign of the Abib, they can be calculated in advance to an infinite degree. I don't know if a lot of you know that, but you know they're able to go back in time and 
look at the star patterns and they can tell you what took place and what happened. Really interesting because it's so precise. It's such a precise um, t uh, time piece. Well, of course it is. Father made it. Hallelujah. Whereas with the Abib barley, one has to wait to the very last moment to know whether the barley is ripe enough to declare the first month of the year. If one pays attention to the heavenly signs like Bereshit, Genesis chapter 1 instructs, one will already know whether the barley will be a bee or not. Well in advance. We don't have to wait for it. This is not to say that we should ignore testing and searching for the abi. It is the second witness. We should simply realize that there is a greater sign, the heavenly, and a lesser sign, the earth. The greater is first, the lesser is second. All right, here's a little side note. Might make some of y'all uncomfortable. Maybe not. Could, could there be a deeper meaning to this? The greater sign, Yahuwah, while the lesser sign is Yahusha? I'm going to leave that alone. Maybe somebody will get a revelation. Yet both are and should be in agreement with each other. Doesn't that sound like Yahuwah and Yahusha? And declare the same thing. Doesn't that sound like Yahuwah and Yahusha? The first month of the year. The very fact that a bee barley is an earthly sign and Yahuwah declares that the ordinance of the stars have dominion over the earth, Aretz, should be quite revealing. This is additional evidence that the abib barley is caused by the heavenly bodies above it. So, by understanding the heavenly bodies, one can then know when to expect the abib barley. The Hebrew word Matzara, Matzara, translates Matzaroth, is defined by Strong's uh, as the following. A, uh, the 12 signs of the Zodiac, that's pagan, that's Talmudic, and that's Kabbalic, mm -hmm. and the 36 associated constellations. Therefore, just as Bereshit, one declares the stars have a relationship to determine the seasons. Yet, so the, we got these two different ways. Yet, nowhere in all of the scriptures does it say how to use the Mazoroth ma -zora, to determine the appointed times. We have two seasons we need to determine on the calendar the spring feast and the fall feast. Examine the pattern of the sun and stars, it might just be obvious to determine the timing of both spring and fall. Even though Bereshit chapter 1 does not specifically say how to use the stars to determine the seasons, it becomes very clear to us, it becomes very clear to the regular observer of the stars that they have a pattern and yields an interesting result in both the start of spring and the start of fall. The observer of the stars would realize that that there are two major events that happen between the winter and the summer season. Sins. Certain stars begin to fall or dip below the horizon. This might remind you of some interesting things said by the prophets and also by Yahusha as it relates to the day of Yahuwah and we'll, we'll get into that a little later. In addition to this, one other note, notable thing happens twice a year, connecting the sun to the events of the falling of the stars. The day and night become equal. Any observer would realize that these markers indicate a switch from winter to spring and from summer to fall. Again, as Bereshit declares, chapter 1, it is the stars, sun, and moon that play a role in his calendar, and we also see here how the sun is connected to the stars. Physicist Bill uh, Wuckler explains how easy it would be for ancient Yasharal to determine the first month of the year, which, of course, as further evident, evidenced by the Abib, the second witness, is the season of spring, uh, 
is when the season of spring starts, noted by the vernal equinox. I tried to get a picture of this man. I couldn't find one. I could not find a picture of him because I wanted to show who he was, but this is what he said. In Moses' time, when the sun was in that pagan constellation, at the vernal equinox on March 21st, it was pretty close to the Abedron, Abedron, 52 degrees, also within about 25 degrees of the Palisades. The sun, as the sun is making its annual track towards the vernal equinox, it is moving daily uh, along the ecliptic closer, closer, and closer, closer, and closer to the Albedon. Al bed Aran. Also, exactly three weeks after the vernal equinox, the sun and Al bed Aran have the same ecliptic longitude. So, what I am saying is this in Moshe's time, Moses' time, as the sun was uh, approaching the vernal equinox, each night just after sunset, one could watch Al bed Aran and the palisades setting in the early e uh, evening sky. Each night, the palisades and the uh, bedroom, uh set earlier and earlier, such that at the time of the vernal equinox, our bedroom is just barely visible at nautical twilight. That means on the sea, nautical. And the palisades is no longer visible at sunset, thus. Since one cannot see the stars behind the sun due to the sun's brilliance, Albedrin, Albedrin, uh and the Palisades are the last note, notable signs and visible just before the vernal equinox. The Palisades being an open cluster of fainter stars disappearing in the glow of, of sunset first, then you start watching for Albedrin. When after sunset, just as the stars start becoming visible, you notice that Albedrin is becoming very hard to spot. And now the, now the vernal equinox is near or has happened. So we got, we got a secular person says, yeah, they could have done it very easily. Philo, the Hebrew historian and contemporary of Yahusha, the Mashiach, and the apostles says that Musa established the moon of the vernal equinox as the first month of the year. And there's the book and where you can read it and there's the information. Josephus, the Hebrew historian, also confirms this and defines it as when the sun was in um, that pagan deity's constellation. What this means, before I start that, I'll take a little sip. What this means is that they would use the stars to calculate the vernal equinox and then use the timestamp of the vernal equinox to find the first opportunity for the spring feast to follow. At the same time, they would also witness the Abib barley in accordance to these heavenly signs. Not only that, it is quite easy to do. The reality is that in an agricultural sense, a farming community had to watch for such signs to determine the growing seasons. See, man is doing this already. I do it. I, I, I've done it. I grow stuff. I, my, my winter crop is in. I'm already looking towards the, what I got to plant for spring. And in summer. So I'm looking for the season. I'm watching the environment. I'm watching insects. What insects show up and what don't. Because of course I'm looking at pollination. As well. So these are things we naturally do. It is not. It, it is of no consequence. That the spring feast begin. At first fruits. And that the fall feast concludes. Uh, with the end of the harvest. Both of these appointed times fall directly after the signs in the heavens by the stars. The spring feasts occur in the spring. On or after the spring equinox. The fall feast in the fall. On the close or after the fall equinox. 
In Shemot 34.22, we read that the Feast of Sukkot is to occur at the year's end. Let's read that. And perform the festival of Shabbat for yourself of the first fruit of wheat harvest and the festival of ingathering at the turn of the year, Tak U Fa. The Hebrew word for year end here literally means turn or circuit of the year, Shona. So, we are looking for something that is a circuit of a year and it has a turn. As we reveal in the beginning, in Bereshit chapter 1, we learn that the sun, moon, and stars are the determining, are to determine the muadim, or the appointed times. So Kut, then, is one of the appointed times that are to be calculated using the sun, moon, and stars. So, out of the sun, moon, and stars, only the sun and stars contain an annual circuit. And the only observable turn that occurs around them, uh, uh, around the time of Sukkot, is the fall equinox. Some object to Shemot 34.22, referring to the equinox. However, the only yearly circuit turn that exists embedded in the pattern of the sun, moon, or stars established in Bereshit chapter 1 is the spring and fall equinox. See, this is why Father says we got to look at creation. We'll learn about him. Scripture will make sense. And then nobody can go against that because the evidence is in creation. The Hebrew word occurs, circuit, turn, um, three additional times in the Tanakh. Tahalim, Psalms 19.6, in the context of the circuit of the sun, says, its rising is from one end of the heavens, and its circuit to the other end, and not is hidden from its heat. And in the context of the fall feast regarding the birth of Shamael, we go to Shamael Aleph, one and uh, verse twenty, chapter one, verse twenty, and it comes to be at the turn of the days that Hananiah. Or Hannah, excuse me, conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel because I have asked you who will for him. We got 2 Chronicles 24, 23. And it comes to be that at the turn of the year that the army of Amram, Aram came up against him and they came into Yehuda and Jerusalem and destroyed all the rulers of the people from among the people and sent all their spoil to the sovereign of Damascus. When the spring feasts are assigned to be the first opportunity following the spring equinox, the feast of Sukkot, and the last great day will either land on or close Thereafter, the fall equinox, just as Shemut 34 dictates. See, these are what this is why we gotta know some stuff. Because there's some, as I mentioned earlier, there's gonna be some things Father has on his timeline, and they're gonna happen when he has appointed them to. So we need to know what what are these feast days? What is the first day of the month? How do we calculate it? Because he's going by his time frame, not ours. So, there are important markers for both the spring and fall feasts that are particular to our Creator's calendar. Thus, not only do Yahuwah's light in the heavens serve as markers for his appointed times, but they also serve as valuable and important agricultural markers as well to the degree that the average farmer would be already watching for them. So as long as the first day of unleavened bread falls in the spring, meaning the first opportunity following the vernal equinox, then the barley will be ripe in the time for first fruits. And the fall feast of Sukkot will also be in the fall. The spring feasts are exactly that, spring feast. They are there to mark the beginning of the harvest cycle. 
The fall feast of Sukkot marks the close of the harvest cycle when all of the grain is brought in. The equinox is the spring and fall or the turn in which the circuit marked or mark the close proximity of the spring and fall feast. Also, that also agriculturally mark the start and close of the grain harvest seasons. There is a lot of consider, there's a lot to consider there prophetically as well, but that is for another teaching. I promise you that. No. <clears throat> Though there has been reports of barley being ripe slightly before the vernal equinox, it is not possible for barley to be ripe a full month or one new moon early, thus ensuring that both the stars and the heavenly sign and the abib, the earthly sign, are always in agreement with each other. Likewise, because of the short growing season of barley, it is not possible to make the first month of the year much later. Or one would fully miss the Abib barley for the first month. The spring feast will always be in spring just after the spring vernal equinox and the Abib barley. The fall feast will also be in the fall or on or just after the fall vernal equinox. The common debate of barley versus equinox are really unnecessary because in reality, in the end, and for all practical purposes, they are just violently, violently debates or violent debates fighting with each other and not a reason together of Yah's right ways. In the end, they produce the exact same result. The sun and the stars produce spring. Spring produces a bee. Spring produces the spring feast. Does that, I mean, that's pretty simple. I mean, it's kind of simple, right? Some have asked whether the first day of the month must always be after the equinox. By my studies, I have concluded that the spring feast must always be after the equinox because the spring feast must be in the spring. Unless somebody wants to send me some other information, I'm willing to review it. But per my studies, that's where I landed, ended up. Here's the problem. If we force the first day of the month to be after the equinox, whether one believes in the sighting of the sliver or conjunction to begin in the first of the month, and we, and we will get to that soon, the problem would be the same. Remember, the Abib barley must be found within the boundaries of first month or one lunar cycle and there's a scriptures there to to uh, uh, say what scripture says about that we already kind of went over them if the barley harvest comes to a close in the last week of April and because the earliest that barley becomes ripe following a beef is two weeks that means that the last moment of any possible beef in Israel or Yasharal could occur around April 9th to April 16th. This is what is important. This is what is important to realize. So once we get to know all this stuff and, and get it down, and I pray and hope there's some out there who would really take this underneath their their wing and, and become proficient at it. There's somebody out there that has a calling to this. So I'm talking to you. The latest the latest then that a lunar cycle can begin to start a new month following the equinox is about April 13th or 14th. It is the last moment of a beam and Yasharal occurs on April occurs on April 9th and the first day of the first month is to occur on April 13th. Then, then guess what? The first month of the year just missed out on a beam because a beam was the month prior. That don't work. No work. If the rule is that the first day of the first month occurs in such a way to allow for the spring feast to occur at the first opportunity to be in spring, meaning a close to the equinox as possible after the equinox occurred, then the problem of being too early for a bee or too late for a bee will never happen. Now I'm going to tell you what the Catholic Church does for their celebration of what they call 
resurrection. It starts with the E, and I'll just leave it at that. They are they don't care about any of this. They move it around as they want to, as they see fit. And part of the reason why they move it around, they don't want it to match up with Pesach. So we're we're not doing those things. We're following scripture. We're not doing what we want to do. We're trying to follow and figure out how do we do what Father says to do. It is the only method in which the Abib barley as the earthly sign and the sun and the stars as the heavenly signs will always 100% agree with each other. Historically, one can backtrack this and determine this to be the case. The earth sign of Abib and the heavenly sign of the equinox will always agree with each other. Think about it. Think about this for a moment. So both have to agree all the time, and they do, unlike man. Having the first day of the first month on the Hebrew calendar to fall near the second week of April for first fruit fruits would be very late in the barley harvest season. The harvest usually starts at the end of March or beginning of April. The Karaites focus on the Abib barley to determine the first month of the year is not wrong in any capacity. However, it is simply focusing on the lesser sign, the agricultural earth sign. The heavenly sign will produce the exact same result as the heavenly as the uh, as the heavenly signs agree with the earthly signs. Thus, there is not really any debate on that on this particular matter of the calendar with the exception of the Anuk or Enoch or Honuk calendar proponents, proponents, as they would object because of the usage of the moon. Thus, the debate is not equinox or B barley. The, an the answer actually, the answer actually yes to both, not either or. So what is the conclusion? So to calculate the first month of the year, we must find the first opportunity that would place the 15th day of the first month after the spring equinox for the heavenly sign according to what? In the beginning, Bereshit chapter 1. In doing so, we will find that there will be at least some Abib at the start of the month. There will also be some ripe barley in the land in the first in the time of uh, four first fruits to be brought to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, according to the earthly agricultural sign as detailed in Shemot, we've been reading. This is not to say that all barley will be ripe in Yasharal, as previously stated. We go back to Leviticus 2.14, um, allows for a bee barley to be brought into to Jerusalem, for or Jerusalem for first fruits. Now that we have determined how to calculate the first month of the year, the next step is determine how to calculate the first day of the month. Reasoning together through scripture on how to calculate the first day of the month. Y'all feel like y'all in school, don't you? <laughs> All this technical stuff mathematics and science and that's the calendar this is how we do it so there's some of you eating this up there's some of you going Ugh. well we need to know it if there is any debate on the calendar 90 percent of it is on this matter with the exception of the anuk enoch hanuk so-called calendar prop proponents all agree that the moon establishes the first day of the month but how do we know this scripturally? Because it's got to be scripture, right? We already reviewed Bereshit chapter 1. We're back to the beginning again. And proved how the lesser of the two great lights must be the moon. Is there more to this? Sounds too simple? The answer is that the Hebrew word for month, Hodesh, or Hodesh, itself indicates a connection to the moon. The word, the Hebrew word, Chodesh, Strong's 2320 in the Hebrew, 
is linguistic, uh, der linguistic derive derivative of the Hebrew word Hadesh, Hebrews Strong's twenty three eighteen, which means to restore, repair, or renew oneself. Is that not what the moon does every single month? The moon is restored or repaired, as the Hebrew would think, at the beginning of the month as light begins to be revealed from the moon. I will discuss the spiritual significance of this in a moment. Remember, the physical teaches the spiritual and vice versa. We can also see this connection in a number of instances in which Hodesh, month, is used interchangeably with the word yara, the, uh, the common scriptural Hebrew word for moon, which by extension is also, also means month. For example, Malach, Malachim, Aleph, 1 Kings 8, 2, in the month yara of Athenim, 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 Athenim which is the seventh month, Hodesh. Another proof that Hodesh is related to the moon, Yara, is the phrase a Hodesh month of days. And you can go to Genesis 29, 14, or Bar Midbar, Numbers 11, uh, 20 to 21. It will express it there, which is the equivalent to the phrase a Yara month, moon of days. You can also go to Debraim, uh, twenty-one thirteen, and, and Malachim Aleph, Malachim second. That's supposed to be Malachim Bet, fifteen thirteen. Clearly, then Hodesh is related to Yara, which literally means moon. Because of this relationship, that is established in the original Hebrew language of Scripture that we just reviewed. Translators in the past have taken liberty to interpret Hodesh as moon in many instances of English translations. This is why you guys got to get your books and your concordances and you got to research these scriptures out as the rug leads you to from wherever state of maturity, maturity you're in to get you deeper and better understanding. There's a lot to study in scripture. So much. And it's beautiful. It's wonderful. Blow your head off. And then it'll grow back. Okay. To be clear, what we just witnessed was not English translators interchanging month for moon. What we actually just witnessed was the original language interchanging month for moon. In my humble opinion, those instances would have been much better left as month instead of new moon as that would have been more Linguistically accurate, that's my opinion. I'm just going to leave it at that. So you may disagree with that, but th that's my research and what seemed appropriate. And I, and I could be wrong about that, but that's my opinion. However, just because translators took the liberty does not mean that they were necessarily in error. As we see in the example that uh, were given in the Tanakh, Yar Yara as moon and Hodesh as month are indeed used interchangeably. Also, Yagra, uh, chapter 23, declares that Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, is on the first of the month. Let's read. And Yahuwah spoke to Musa, saying, Speak to the children of Yasharal, saying, In the seventh new moon, on the first day of the new moon, you have rest, a remembrance of Teruah. Amos, 8.5, the day of tabernacles, excuse me, the day of trumpets, is the only important time that occurs on the first day of the month and is also declared to be a Sabbath. This is the day, re day referenced in Amos 8.5, which people were buying and selling and thus causing others to work and serve them on the Sabbath, saying, when does the new moon pass so that we sell and and Sell, we sell grain and the Sabbath so that we trade our wheat to make the ephah small and the shakal shackle large and to 
falsely, falsely, falsify, excuse me, the scales by deceit. They actually said that. What's one of the things that Father hates? A scale that is weighted down falsely. And they weren't even, and they didn't even love the Sabbath. They just wanted to hear up and sell some stuff and make a lot of money. Sell a little bit and make a lot. Greed. Clearly they were not interested in the month being over because that was nothing that had nothing to do with Sabbath. It must be another instance in which the Hebrew word for month is really implied uh is implying the moon. Excuse me, it's really implying the moon. And it must be a Sabbath. Because it is only on Sabbath in which we are not to buy and sell so that others do not work for us, but instead rest. The only Sabbath that can be spoken of here is the only Sabbath that is determined by a new moon on the first day of the month. Recall that the root of the word of Hodesh means renewal or repair. They were selfishly asking when the renewal or repair of the moon might be over for Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, so that the Sabbath would conclude and they could then buy and sell once again. I'm going to tell you something. I believe this is prophetic as well because it says that we won't be able to buy and sell. Right? And I, I believe there's a connection with Sabbath. About not being able to buy and sell. I know a lot of people think it's going to be certain things. I believe it might be that. But Sabbath is going to be the, the, the main issue. The seventh day Sabbath. And people might say, why? Satan, this is Satan's world. And he doesn't want that proclaimed. He wants people to believe we came from monkeys. That's what he wants to believe. He calls humans animals. You're just a bunch of animals. And we are not. We're, we are creating an image of the Most High. We are royal priesthood in development. Hallelujah. This means that they were looking for the sliver of the moon to tell them when Yom Teruah, Yom Teruah, the day of, of trumpets, was over. Not when Yom Teruah, day of trumpets, was beginning. You got to read it correctly. Only some proponents of the Anuk or Hanuk Enoch calendar dismissed the usage of the moon, but it appears that could be a misunderstanding of the book of Anuk, or Enoch, or Hanuk. Let's read uh, the 74th chapter. We're going to read 11 through 17, then we're going to 73, uh, 13 through 14, and then 12 and 16. The moon brings all the years exactly that their station may come neither to forwards nor to backwards a single day, but that the years may be changed with correct precision in 364 days. In their years and days are 1,092. To the moon alone belong, a belong in three years 1,062 days. So that the moon has 30 days less than the sun and stars. The year then becomes truly complete according to the station of the moons and the station of the sun. So the moon may have more to do with Anuk or Enoch's calendar than many may realize. Usually the question is not whether the new moon begins a new month, but what exactly is a scriptural new moon? That's a good question. The crescent and the conjunction. There are two schools of thought on this matter. The crescent and the conjunction. Talking about the moon. It is in these two schools of thought that much debate, fighting, here we are again, and passion exists behind each position. I have never seen, I mean, I guess there's some other things, but wow, this calendar debate is something else. It's really, I mean, people putting on gloves. They're ready to fight for free. At least you're going to fight. Make some money. Make an event. 
But my goodness, it's unbelievable. We're not to behave this way. Why are we fighting? Scripture says not to do that. Obviously, only one position can be accurate. What we will attempt to do is examine what the Debar, the word of Yah, says, and then we will examine what the Debar, the word of Yah, in the flesh, teaches Yahushua our Mashiach. Before we can examine each position, we should entertain a brief preparing our understanding on the moon. We're going to go to school. You ready for some science? Here we go. The moon has an observable cycle ranging from about 29 days, 6 hours, to 29 days, 20 hours, averaging 29 days, 12 hours. This means that the moon has a range of about 6 to 8 hours on either end of its average. The conjunction is when, is when the, the sun and the moon are aligned on the same side of the earth. And the side of the moon visible from the earth is not illuminated by the sun. Now I know some people don't believe um, that, the, that the sun, or excuse me, the moon is illuminated by the sun. Um, they believe it is, it is its own power source. Uh, that that's gonna be for another time. We'll deal with that later. So I'm aware I'm aware of that debate <laughs> or that understanding as well. The events last for about two or three minutes, and then uh, luminosity from the lum luminosity from the sun is the, then once again reflected. Again, the actual conjunction only lasts just a few minutes, and the real sliver of the moon is about three to four minutes after the conjunction. So the actual astrono astronomical conjunction is very, very brief and starts being repaired or renewed in just a couple of minutes. The actual debate finding is not between moon conjunction and moon sliver, but moon conjunction and the ability to see the moon sliver. Recall the Hebrew word of the month for the month <laughs> being Kodesh, which has a root meaning of repair and renew. However, despite the fact that the conjunction only lasts a few minutes at most, the human eye has to wait till about 3 to 5% luminosity until the moon is usually visible to make to uh to the naked eye that can take about one to three days after the the moment of conjunction even though it might take a while for the human to physically see the light it is important to note that the moon starts reflecting light just a few minutes after the full conjunction on average there is 14.765 days between the conjunction of the full moon and 14.765 days between full moon and conjunction with a few hours of uh, variance on either side. Regardless of which position is the scriptural new moon, the reality is that determining the timing of the conjunction and full moon is not as challenging as some make it out to be. So let's examine the practical difference between the crescent and conjunction positions. What we want to understand and determine is which one of these is the scriptural new moon. Okay, take a little sip. Y'all good? All right, the crescent position. The crescent position traditionally requires two persons to see the sliver of the moon following a conjunction. However, because of the human perception, the moon can appear as though it is giving no light for about one to three days and is usually visible to a human by the time it hits about 5% luminosity. Once it is visible, it will be in the form of a crescent. Thus, in this view, the appointed days of Yahuwah are determined by men seeing the visible light from the moon. Once the moon is sighted, 
The official first day of the month is determined and clear uh, de and declared by men, and uh, and they announce it to the rest. The conjunction position. The conjunction position establishes the first day of the month on the day of the conjunction or sometimes the day after the conjunction, depending on one's position. Observation of the nearing conjunction and then arrival conjunction would suffice for most situations. However, in moments of when observation is not precise enough, there is a math at the 8th grade level that they could have used to calculate the moment of conjunction. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This is 8th grade, but this is beyond me. I can tell you that. So I debated with myself if I was going to put this in or not. But there's somebody out there that understands this, will eat it up, and love it. So for one uh, that is interested, here is that math. So I'll leave it up there for a little bit. Uh, this math is at an 8th grade level. Apparently, my math has never been that good. And so uh, I need somebody who is greater than I in math to show me this. I looked at him and, eh. So it's up there for you guys to, to take shots of or whatever. And uh, for those of you who are proficient and have that gifting, hallelujah. It looks complicated. And in some respects, it is. At least for us. Maybe I should say me. But can, but consider the ancient civilizations computed things much more, comp uh, much more challenging than this as we covered earlier. The ancients were able to do it. They didn't have the internet. They, they, they were able to do this. They were very amazing. The ancient monuments are still um, existing temporarily. Or testimony, excuse me. Are, are still existing testimony to their mathematical accomplishments so we would be silly to assume that this was way too complicated for them there are structures today that even ancient pagans built that we still could not build today with our technology our technology and knowledge we can't do the pyramids and over in, in peru there's all these structures and they're so precise and science can't figure out. They're scratching their heads. How'd they do this with, with no uh, modern toolage? Um, they did it with ancient tools. Amazing. So many claim that calculating anything in the heavens was beyond them is clearly misguided. Once the calculation is completed, the first day of the month is then determined and declared. Perhaps months or even years in advance. This means that the Hebraic calendar could have been known by all those in Israel for years in advance. It's possible. One, once calculated, it could be disseminated to everyone quite easily at the three annual feast days. This is a real difference between using the conjunction method versus the citing method. So this all these little nuances we don't really know, uh, you know. Did how did they know? Did they pass around? Or did they not? There's you know there's things you can kind of think consider, but you know Father couldn't put everything in the book. It'd be too heavy to carry around, and, <laughs> and I mean we have a hard enough time understanding what we got. Too many scrolls. Oh oh my goodness gracious, Chef Bardi. Okay. There is a real difference, or I read that, the uh, practical difference between crescent and conjunction is the difference of one through three days, and a one to three days is not to throw off any, uh, not to throw off every appointed day if one is using the incorrect method. And the one to three days is enough to throw off every appointed day. I didn't like how I read that. If one is using the incorrect method. But what is the correct method? This will take some study and explanation. Regardless of what direction we go on this matter, we realize we are going to upset some people with any position we take. Can't make everybody happy. But this, this ministry is not here to make everybody happy. We're here to make Yahuwah happy. And those who want to make him happy can join us and be with us and let's make him happy. We're not here to make... And in that, we will make each other happy for those who want to make Yahuwah happy. Okay, I said that a lot, didn't I? Before we examine what Yahushua taught, let us continue to examine what the Tanakh teaches. 
As we revealed in the pattern established in the beginning, we believe that there was first darkness, then light. That's the pattern Yahuwah gave us. This ministry believes it proves true for the sun giving us night and day. It's in scripture. We read a bare sheet, didn't we? Chapter 1. We also believe the same pattern, not a different pattern, exists for the moon as well. First darkness, then light. Let's continue to reason on the patterns we discover in bare sheet, examining the evidence. In Samuel Aleph, we have an event in which Dawood intentionally misses a new moon feast. He didn't celebrate the new moon or the new month. Dawood intended, intends to disappear for three evenings, which is interesting because of the time between the calculations, calculated conjunction and visible crescent is one to three days. I think there's something also here when he disappears for three days has to do with the Mashiach as well. Highly interesting. I'm going to leave that there. Samuel Aleph 25, 20, chapter 20, verse 5. And that was said to uh, Yanuthan, See, tomorrow is the new moon, and I ought to sit with the sovereign to eat, but let me go, and I shall hide in the field until the third day at evening. Know how they knew in advance that it was going to be a new moon and thus a new moon. A new month, excuse me. The new moon was clearly calculated in advance. It has not, it was not a surprise, but already known. That can only suggest conjunction because only the conjunction can be calculated in advance by simple math. However, note, how there was an expectation of a feast with the king lasting until the third evening. So if it is the conjunction that is calculated and being defined here as the new moon and the determining factor is declaring the first day of the month, what were they waiting for by the third evening? But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field until the third evening. The only logical conclusion is that there were waiting for confirmation that the new moon was over by the sighting of the sliver. The conjunction began their feast and declared the new month. And even though they literally the the literal the literally new month is simply one day, it is clear that the visible crescent ended their celebration of it. It is the only visible lunar event that happens up to three days later from the observable and calculable conjunction. So, it makes sense why Dawood chose to wait till the third evening because he knew that at minimum, the moon would be sighted by then to conclude the festivities. In addition, if he is hiding in the field at night, then because of the conjunction, anyone searching for him would have a difficult time finding him as the moon had no light. Therefore, inciting of the sliver still as, has value. But instead of determining the first day of the month, it determines that the conjunction or the new month has already happened and then ended. More evidence of the same is presented in Samuel Aleph 20, and that's going to be verse 18. So Jonathan said to him, tomorrow is a new moon and you shall be missed because you sat for your seat shall be empty. And then we're going to go to verse 27 of the same book. And it came to be the next day, the second day of the new moon, that Dawood's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, why has the son uh, ye shall not come to eat, either yesterday or today. And so then we go to verse 34 in that same book. And Jonathan rose up from the table in the heat of displeasure and ate no food the second day of the new moon, for he was grieved for Dawood because his father put him to shame. 
the time between the conjunction and the visible crescent is one to three days, as we've already said. Why would a new moon celebration last up to up to several days with a lunar sighting only perspective? The new moon would begin when the moon was sighted and conclude the following evening. What we have here is a feast that begins with the conjunction as the start of the month and ends with the crescent to validate that the new moon did occur and is conclusively over. It is only in that situation that the celebration as a tradition, I want to emphasize that it was a tradition, the celebration, would continue for more than one day because in that method, the first day of the month is not declared until the sliver of the moon is sighted. The conjunction established the first day of, month, of the month and they waited till the sighting of the crescent to confirm that the conjunction happened as expected. That can take anywhere, again, from one to three days, whereas the sighting only method is always just one day. We also see that this mentally surface with the corrupt and uh, with the corrupt and Sabbath breaking merchants who buy and sell on the Sabbath. Let's go back to Amos 8.5 saying, when does the new moon pass so that we sell grain and the Sabbath so that we trade our wheat to make the ephah small and the shackle large and to falsely oh, falsify the scales by deceit. Consider this. Why did we have to ask when the new moon would be over? Excuse me, why do we? Why did they have to ask when the new moon was over? If any of y'all ask that question, you're really old. Scripturally, the day would be over when the sun went down and they would not have to ask. But because Typically, in their tradition, they would declare it for two to three days as a feast, as we just observed in 1 Samuel, from conjunction till crescent. And in practice, that is how it was observed. Then the observa observation became longer than an actual day. In this case, they were referring to Yom Teruah, the Day of Trumpets, which is the only commanded new moon Sabbath day. This might be why Yom Teruah, Day of Trumpets, became traditionally known as the day where a man knows the day or hour. Not because they didn't know when it started, but because in practice and tradition, they did not know when it ended. That was something new to me. I was like, oh, that's interesting. They would use the scriptural, scriptural marker of the conjunction to start the month. But their tradition carried it through till the crescent and thus then did not know when it ended and neither did Dawood. He just knew that if he was not there till the third evening, the third day, that the crescent would have been sighted and the end of the tradition and the end of the tradition of the feast. Let's go back to Samuel Olive uh, 25 through 6. And Dawood said to Jonathan, See, tomorrow is the new moon, and I ought to sit with the sovereign to eat, but let me go, and I shall hide in the field until the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then you shall say, Dawood earnestly asked my permission to run over to Bethlehem, his city. For the, lily, the yearly slaughtering is made there for all the clan. Even though they did, even though they could calculate the exact hour of the conjunction, and the fact that, the fact that in reality Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, is literally and scripturally just one day, from evening to evening. But to just be sure they kept the day correctly in case they made an error in calculation, they would keep the day until they saw the moon um, and then the feast would end. The crescent 
does not begin the feast in their practice, the crescent ended it. The official day started with the conjunction and ended in, in practice two to three days later with a sighting. Thus, the new moon is when the moon is fully dark. Hold on to that. Fully dark is the new moon. If this is challenging your current view, keep in mind it challenged mine as well. There is, there is still more than this, ultimately leading up to what Yahusha taught. At this point, some might ask, how does a month starting in darkness make any scriptural sense? Glad you asked. Reasoning with all the information that has been given through scriptural evidence and think Hebraically. You can't think like you think if you're not a Hebrew. If it's fully dark, uh, would mean the, the regular moon would be the next day? Well, we'll keep going and you'll find out. Also remember, the physical teaches the spiritual. We forget that. We forget everything is scriptural. We've been so used, we came out of Babylon, we compartmentalized everything. Ye Yahuwah was over here, my life is over here, and my the world, nature does this, and it doesn't, I don't really see the connection in Scripture. No, it, it all. Remember, who created all this? A spirit. His name is Yahuwah. So everything is spiritual. Everything begins in darkness. Everything begins in darkness. It always has. This is the pattern. We're back at Bereshit chapter 1, 2, and 3. Creation began in darkness. And the earth came to be formless and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit, the Ruach of Elohim, was moving on the face of the waters. And Elohim said, let light come to be, and light came to be. And it wasn't the luminaries, by the way, but we're not going to get into that right now. So, First there was night, and then there was day. Likewise, following the same pattern of the sun in the beginning, the month also begins in darkness. We got Eob says it well. Eob says, first there is darkness, and then he brings light from the darkness. Let's go to 12, verse 22 of Eob. He reveals mysteries from the darkness and brings the deep darkness into light. That is the pattern. Darkness, then light. Any other pattern would be a random, odd pink square. Remember from last week or the week before? In the perfect pattern uh, pattern quilt, we call the Dabar, his word, or the word of Yah. And the simple yet scriptural true understanding that the physical teaches the spiritual, we must consider another important matter. Even our spiritual lives start off in complete darkness and wickedness, but the light comes into our lives. Yahuwah calls our attention to a certain, uh, certain period in the moon's life cycle, from darkness or death into being reborn and light growing and shining forth until fullness of light is revealed. The moon starts off in total darkness for about two to three minutes during the conjunction, Jennifer. This is going to answer your question. But then, ever so slowly, light begins to overtake it. And then, for two weeks, it grows brighter, finally becoming what we call a full moon. 100% light at Pesach, Passover, and Unleavened Bread in the spring, and Sukkot in the fall. Does this make more sense now? Okay, good. Remember, the Hebrew word for month, hodesh, actually means to repair, renew, or restore. Isn't that what we need? It's funny that, it, 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 is it a coincidence that Pesach would have a full moon? Is it coincidence that unleavened bread would have a full moon? Is it coincidence that Sukkot would have a full moon? If you understood all the significance of these three Feast days, in particular, it, 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 it makes perfect sense. It's amazing that he was able to do that. That he did do that. It's absolutely mind-blowing. Yahushua calls our attention to the moon from conjunction to determine the new moon month to the full moon in which unleavened bread and Sukkot 
um, fell. I think that's supposed to be Yahuwah, actually. Indeed, darkness is very important to Yahuwah. The covenant with Abraham was made in darkness. Bereshit 15.7 Pesach Passover took place in darkness. Shemot Exodus 12.20 Right? When, when did Father tell him to leave? Not during the day. It was the evening, was it not? Now you leave. Yahushua rose in the dark. Yohanan 21. 20. First one. In fact, Yahuwah dwells in darkness. Shemot 20. 21. Malachim. Aleph. 8. 12. Talim. 18. 11. And the very creation itself began in darkness. Bear sheet chapter 1, verse 2, and ends in darkness, Hazon 20, 11. We did not start off in our lives giving, uh, giving light. We started off in our lives in darkness, literally in the womb. Until we began to reflect his light by coming into the faith. We're going to read Johan in uh, 1246. I have come as a light into the world so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. That means before we had Yahushua and everybody who don't, they were in darkness. So again, first darkness, then light. So then at the point of belief, at the point of belief, begins a process that starts in darkness and that culminates in our inheritance in the end, which is in full light. The spiritual process, of course, relate, related to the messianic events uh, that transpired and will transpire prophetically, respectively, at the spring and fall feast, when the moon reaches 100% luminosity. Do you see what this process teaches us? If you don't get it now, go over it again. You'll get it. These examples are all over Scripture. Let's go to Acts 26, 18. To open the eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. See, darkness is first. There it is again. And from the domination of Hasatan to Yahuwah. That's darkness again. Hasatan. And then going to you, who is light. And they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Again, here's another pattern, darkness, then light. There is a personal application in these understandings, but also perhaps a global application in his body as well. Remember, it takes two weeks for the moon to go from complete darkness to full light. When Yahushua arrived, it was said already that we were in darkness. But when he arrived, the light began to return to his people. Hallelujah. Yohanan Aleph uh, 2.8 On the other hand, I'm writing a new command commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Hallelujah. Consider this. And just perhaps that two weeks is symbolic of two days. Or 2,000 years. From the time that the light came. Or Yahusha came to begin removing the darkness. What this would mean, and not surprisingly... If you already think Hebraically, is that Yah's people have a pattern of going into darkness and into light, just like the phases of the moon. Boy, as a shepherd, as a pastor, as a leader, as an elder, is that statement ever correct as I watch scripture and I watch it in, in the life that I get to live and see? However, perhaps about 2,000 years after his first coming, as indicated in the two weeks of the moon cycle of darkness to full light, he will return and the first 
and the first resurrection resurrection will bring us into the full light shredding our flesh and putting on our incorruptible bodies hallelujah i can't wait for that i don't know about y'all i don't know about y'all but i'm excited about that can't wait I will take my time because I got to wait on Yahuwah. And, but when that day comes, not to be in this body no more. Come on, we all struggle, right? We're all trying to do what's right. But we're struggling. Imagine that never being the case anymore. Imagine that. Always doing what's right. Never having a thought of wrong. Oh, man, I look forward to that day. Think about it this way. The moon reflects light and has no real light of its own. I know some are going to debate that. Some think it's his own light, uh, power source. We'll just leave it at that for right now. Isn't that just like us? We reflect his light as we have no real light of our own. His light is his Dabar word, or Yahusha. This is why the Yom Teruah, Day of Trumpets, has to be on conjunction. Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, is when the shofar is to sound, to cause all to wake up from the darkness that they are in, and lead them in, uh, lead them to the full light of Sukkot when the Mashiach dwells with us. You guys, seen the connection? Do you see how the physical teaches us the spiritual? The day of Yahuwah and the new moon. Most already agree that Yahusha's return on the future Yom Teruah Day of Trumpets. So most of us already agree on that, right? When Yahusha arrives, it is the beginning of the day of Yahuwah. Let's go to Hazan 26. Blessed and set apart is the one having part in the first resurrection. And the second death possesses no authority over them. But they shall be priests of Yahuwah and of the Mashiach and shall reign with him a thousand years. But why is a thousand years of the masters of the master called the day of Yahuwah? The answer is in Yahuwah's plan of 7,000 years. Remember, the end is revealed in the beginning. Yeshaya, Isaiah 46, 10. The teaching of the seven days of creation parallels... Um, Yahuwah's 7,000 year plan for man as it extends them into eternity. The last thousand years is the Sabbath day, the seventh day. Or the rest that we are waiting to still enter. It is the day of Yahuwah that we look forward to. The rest we are promised to enter. Cause it's gonna be rest from all this stuff that's going on right now. We ain't gonna wear. There ain't gonna be no corona, nothing. They ain't even gonna be the city corona. <laughs> okay, it's not, we got city name corona. That's gone. It's gonna be gone. Hey, okay, we ain't gonna have those things no more. We won't be having all this turmoil, wondering what's going on every day, curfew this and that and the other. Death is gone. Well, not gone completely, but for us, those who transform. In the resurrection, yes. This is what Abraham Hebrews 4 1 is referring to. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest we stand, uh, still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. That's a warning, by the way. Be careful that it, we're waiting for this. Don't be found short of it. It's coming. It is, it is the day of Yahuwah. That we are waiting for the thousand year, the thousand years of the master. This is not a new concept. Kepha also knew about the thousand year period being considered as a day. Let's read in his uh, Kepha bet, Second uh, Peter three eight. But beloved ones, let not this one matter be hidden from you that with Yahuwah. One day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Kepha was not even making this up, but was already an established, but was already an established and revealed as a principle. He was simply quoting to Halim's 94, chapter 90, verse 4. 
This see, they all talk Tanakh. They all took talk Torah. They ain't pull nothing new. This is even prophetically hinted at in Eob or Job, in which we will experience six days or six thousand years of evil and trouble. But in the seventh day or the last thousand years, evil will no longer touch us. Meaning this, we will experience the first resurrection at the beginning of the day of Yahuwah and be in, be in our incorruptible glorified bodies. And thus, on the seventh day, the last thousand years, evil can no longer touch us. Hallelujah. I don't know. I look forward to this. This, this is what I'm living for. I tell you, this day, I'm living for Yahuwah. But he says that I get this if I live for him. And yes, I think about this all the time. That's why I'm not going to the left or to the right. I'm, I'm going to get this. I'm going to do everything I think I can to get it at least. And what Father Shet says, I'm going to do my best. Let's read Eob, Job 519. For six troubles, he will deliver you. Even in seven, evil will not touch you. We all already knew this, but not all of us understood the time components of the process, nor understood that the day of Yahuwah is a thousand years long. The question might be asked, of what importance is it, is it realizing that Yahusha will return on, on Yom Teruah, Day of Trumpets, to begin the day of Yahuwah? This is where it becomes interesting. If Yom Teruah, Day of Trumpets, is on the new moon, and Yahushua returns on a new moon, then even the prophets declare that the new moon will look like, uh, what the new moon would look like on the start of the day of Yahuwah. Let's read. Yeshaya, Isaiah 13, 9 through 10. See, the day of Yahuwah is coming, fierce, with wrath and heat of displeasure. To lay the earth waste and destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and the constellations do not give off their light. The sun shall be dark as its rising and the moon not seen out of its light. So, if Yahusha returns on a new moon, Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, we see that it is expected that the new moon looks exactly like we would expect it to look. It is giving no light. Yahushua said the exact same thing about his return. Let's go to Marcus 13, 23 to 27. And you take heed, see, I have forewarned you of it all. But in those days after that darkness, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give its light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then they shall see the son of Adam coming in the judgment. I put that in parentheses because that's what clouds mean, by the way. Research that one out. With much power and esteem, and then he shall send his messengers and assemble his chosen ones from the four winds from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of the Shamayim. Hallelujah. Again, we see that the moon does not give its light on the new moon, Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets. Also, we see that the stars will be falling. Yeshaya, Isaiah, relates that to the constellations, meaning these are literal stars with constellations. Sometimes it is said the stars are symbolic of fallen Malachim, but, or angels as they call them, but that would make no sense in the context of constellations. We have already covered that as well, so this should be of no surprise. This is specifically mentioning the settling the setting of the constellations, as Yeshaya Isaiah just mentioned, that happened at the time uh, that happens at the time of year. The time of year is expected to arrive in the fall. We mentioned this earlier related to Eo 38, calling attention to the importance of certain constellations as it relates to calculating time. 
We reviewed that at the time of the fall feast, constellations begin to fall to the earth, which is simply the horizon. So we got to learn how to start thinking Hebraic and how they said they we all fall. Oh, stars must be falling to earth. No, it's just a, the way they spoke was different. We got to learn the language. And if we want to understand the end, we must understand the beginning. And since, since the beginning, Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, the moon has not given its light and the stars have not fallen to the earth in the fall equinox. So according to the prophets, the moon not giving its light is, uh, is the very definition of a new moon conjunction, which helps solidify the fact that Yahusha's return on Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, the only appointed time on a new moon. This is completely in sync with what we are teaching, yet a new moon happens every month, 12 13 to 13 times, depending. In the Hebrew, in the Hebrew year, at least. At minimum, this at least validates that on Yom Teruah, Day of Trumpets, the new moon is defined as the moon not giving its light. Yahusha is clearly not returning on a crescent, and thus Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, has nothing to do with a crescent. So, what we know is that Yahusha does return on a new moon at the appointed time of Yom Teruah, day of trumpets, and according to the prophets and Yahusha, that is the day in which the moon does not give its light. Yahusha comes when the moon is physically in darkness. Spiritually, we know that is to be true as well. See, he ain't going to have no competition, by the way. You ain't going to be able to say it was the moon when you see him come. His brilliance is going to outshine everything. Say, so, oh, that was just the moon. No, you're going to know it's Yahusha. Yahusha came when the world is not reflecting the light of the Father. This means that Yahusha will not be arriving at the sighting of a crescent, though it should be, should go without saying. It is not possible to sight a crescent when the moon does not give its light. Um, in this instance, we have Yahusha teaching on the calendar in the uh, in the Teruah of Yahuwah in one of the ways we want it to cover. Remember, Yahusha came to fully teach the Teruah, uh, Teruah, the Torah of Yahuwah. This is one of the ways Yahusha revealed Yahuwah's calendar for his people. Excuse me, that's supposed to be Torah, not Teruah. Um, yet, there is no more blatant way Yahuwah accomplished this, and I will save that for later. Because we cover what Yahusha taught on this subject, we should cover other uh, another example of the scriptural teaching and defining the new moon. New moon in conjunction in Psalms. See, we got to take all the scriptures together. We got to put it together. To Halim's 81, 3 through 4, blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon. At the full moon, Keka, 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 Keka. So I just had to do that. Um, on our solemn day, Hog. For this is a statue for Yasharal, a Torah of Yahuwah of Yaakov. This he established in Yosef. Yosef. Some might not be any stranger to this verse. Some state that the word translated as full moon, keka, is indeed a transl it is translated as a full moon. Those who state that it is to be translated as full moon, correctly cite the fact that there are only three literal feast days in Yah's Dabar word, and two of which occur on the full moon, and none of which fall on a new moon, as mentioned in verse 3. If Keka did mean a, a covered moon, that would be literal, uh, literal direct scriptural evidence that the new moon is defined as the moon being in conjunction, completely dark, not a sliver or crescent. There are only two translation, translation choices, full moon 
or covered moon. There is a serious problem with the full moon translation. This would mean that we are to blow a shofar at both the new moon and the full moon. Talim states that it is a statue of Yasharal and in an instruction or an instruction or Torah of Yah. Let just heaven. Uh oh, did I lose my place? I did. Nope, I did. I went too far. Okay, let's do this again. Verse three. How, how here uh, would be the question to those who believe it is a commandment to blow the shofar on the full moon. Where do we find a commandment to blow the shofar on a full moon in the Torah? It is nowhere to be found. See, this is the traditions of certain people called Jews, and they have this tradition. And we blindly follow them because they claim to be something that they may not be. They're not. The only place we can command to, uh, where we are commanded to blow the shofar trumpet as it relates to the moon is Yom Teruah, Day of Trumpets, on the new moon, just like the first line of verse 3 states, starts off. But nowhere do we find a commandment in the Torah of Yah to blow the shofar on the full moon. Some might refer to uh, Bamidbar, Numbers 10.10, 10, but the only but that only refers to the sliver, uh, silver trumpets. In Hebrew, there is a difference between the shofar trumpet, trumpets, and the silver, cash, cash off trumpets. Excuse me. Kat, zut zara. There is only one instance in which we are commanded to blow the shofar, and that is for Yom Teruah, the Day of Trumpets. So, this is the problem. And Bar Midbar 1010 does not help. Focus on what we are saying here because it is very important. The author of Psalms, Talim, is telling us it is the, teru, uh, the um, Torah of Yah to blow the shofar trumpet on a full moon, on a full moon. And it is and it is really not part of the Torah of Yah, then the scripture is sinning by adding to the Debar the word of Yahuwah. We are commanded not to add to the Torah of Yahuwah from the instructions given at Sinai. And the author of Tahalim comes much later in Sinai. Let's read it. The bar, Deborah 4 2. Do not add to the word, the bar, which I command you, and do not take away from it, so as to guard the commands of Yahuwah, your Elohim, which I am commanding you. If the author of Talim Psalms is saying that it is the Torah of Yahuwah, says that we are to blow the trumpets on a full moon, then its verse is breaking. Debraim 4.2 and Debraim 13. And the author becomes a false prophet. See, we got to be careful what we say about scripture. We don't know how far this domino, you hit one and it has this whole domino effect that you don't realize what you're saying. I hear a lot of people say that, oh, be careful what you're saying because that makes this, this, and that. And you're going to end up here. Do you want to end up there? You may not want to. And how come nobody ever addresses this? The average Karaite responds to this verse in trying to keep his word to mean full moon. Has the author of Psalms become a false prophet? That's a very Charlie position since our Mashiach and other, others quote from Tehillims. The fact of the matter is that Keka cannot mean full moon. It must mean covered moon which means that the new moon is defined by the moon being covered in darkness, also known as conjunction. Either the author of Talim's um, 8081 is a false prophet, or he is telling us that the new moon is a conjunction 
there those who those are are two choices I'm, I'm going to disappear for a moment All right, thank you. Thank you, Brother Kyle, for blowing the show far. <laughs> so I tried, y'all, but I couldn't make it to the end. Uh, I couldn't do it. All right. Uh, let's see, where are we at? Okay. Either the author of uh, Psalms 80, 81 is a false prophet, or he is telling us that the new moon is a conjunction. These are our two choices. microphone is staticky. Okay, should have waited. We are live. Okay, let's say it again. Either the author of Psalms 81 is a false prophet, or he is telling us that the new moon is a conjunction. Now, obviously, I did not cons I, I, I do not consider the author of Telelims, Psalms 81, to be a false prophet. <laughs> but he is, in fact, teaching exactly what my research, our research, has already shown that the new moon is defined as a lunar conjunction. At this point, that does not really mean any way to deny this realization. We still have come, we have still some work to do because there is still the valid point about the fact that Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, is not considered an actual feast of Yahuwah. In that, we will go into the actual Hebrew for Revelation. So let's read Tahalims 81.3, the exact, uh, exact translation from the Hebrew. Blow a shofar in the new moon, in the covering of the day of our festival. Now, we do find the word for a lighted moon in Song of Solomon, or Shlomo, 6.10. Yeshaya, Isaiah 24, 23, Yeshaya 30, 26. Here we find the Hebrew word Kalabana. Kalabana. Microphone. So it never reset, so I gotta go back over all that? No, no, it, the audio was going through, it's just, it sounded bad. Okay. It, uh, let's see how it sounds now. We're live. Oh, we're good? Okay. Um, where was I at? Oh wow, what, wait a minute, what happened? It's good. I'm trying to find where I was at. My fingers did, oh there we are. Yeah, the very first three letters of this word literally means white, which is la bana, or laban, la bana, or laban, meaning white or whiteness. You can even see the meaning in the country called Lebanon, called such because of the white snowy hilltops and mountaintops. Something else I found out too, I didn't know that. This would be the word to use for full moon if the author of Tahalims intended to use the word full moon, but he doesn't. Instead, Tahalim uses the exact opposite word. He uses the word be kasa. Biba kasa. Takia means same kind of loud, some kind of loud noise. You know, you heard the trumpets, the the takia blast. Was a particular way. That's a takia blast. B. Kadash literally means on the month or interchangeably the new moon. We got shofar means trumpet. So, so far we have blow at or on the new moon, the shofar. So, so far. You caught that. <laughs> Very good. B. Kasa means at the concealment. The word is kuf, samik. And hey, that is generally rendered kasa. Kasa. Kasha. The first place the word is used is the Bereshit 1719. 719. 
where the waters covered the earth, clearly demonstrating that the moon, Hodesh, in Telemus 8.31, verse 3, is covered, which is the exact opposite of being full, which would be the word Labana, or Laban. Though the author of Telemus 81 uses Hodesh for month, we showed earlier in the teaching how month and moon in the Hebrew can be interchangeable. We know that Telemus 81 must be using Hodesh as moon because a month cannot be covered, but the moon must certainly can. That is just one more example that proves that at the Hebrew level, month and moon not only can but should be used interchangeably. So we quit so we see quite clearly that the new moon is being defined as it actually being concealed or hidden, giving no light, completely consistent with what we research with what the research has revealed so far. We still need to deal with the fact that Talmud 81 verse 3 refers to the feast hog and Yom Teruah, it, uh, Days of Trump, is technically not a feast. It is a Moed, or appointed time. There are only three feasts. Shemot 23, 14. Three times in a year you shall keep a feast to me. I thought it was for them Jews. Uh, <laughs> these three feasts are unleavened bread, Shabbat, which they call in, in Greek, Pentecost, and Sukkot, or Feast of Tabernacles. At all feasts, Hug, are appointed times, Moedim, but not all appointed times are feasts. Yom Teruah, the Day of Trumpets, would be an example of being an appointed time, but not being a feast. The issue in Talmud 81, verse 3, would then be saying that the Day of Trumpets on the new moon which is defined by the conjunction, is on the feast day, which is clearly not true according to the Torah of Yahuwah. Yet, when we examine the Hebrew, it becomes more clear. In the actual Hebrew, it actually states, in the actual Hebrew, it actually states, going toward our feast day versus on our feast day. The Hebrew word for day has a little lamet in front of it. That's modern Hebrew. The word picture is a shepherd's staff. It literally means to lead. It means leadership. When the shepherd takes the staff, it leads the sheep forward. It really doesn't mean on like it's been translated in English. It means leading into the feast day, not on the feast day. The number one meaning of lamet as a prefix is to mean toward, not on. So please understand this because it is extremely very important. This has a massive impact on the translation of the verse once the prefix lamet is considered. Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, leads us into the feast day toward Sukkot, which is two weeks later, only on lemon bread, Shavuot, and Sukkot, are Hagodim, or Feast of Yahuwah. The author of Telem 81.3 cannot be calling Yom Teruah, the Day of Trumpets, a feast day, lest he again be guilty of adding to the Debar the word of Yahuwah. So the typical and knowledgeable Karite Jew often argues that Telem 81.3 is to be Translate as full moon so that it could be referencing a blowing of the sh uh, trumpet on Sukkot or unleavened bread and must and must see that as a valid point till one realizes that there is nothing in the Torah of Yah about us blowing trumpets the shofar on a full moon which then makes the author of Talmud 81 again out to be a false prophet by adding to the Torah of Yahuwah. Again, we got to be careful about adding to his word. It's a domino effect. And we can put ourselves, we'd be bringing his name tonight.
There is only one possible way to reconcile this verse. There is no contradictions in Talim 81 verse 3. The author of Talim 81 is not a false prophet. It is clearly teaching that the new moon or the first day of the month begins in darkness and that it is directly stating that Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, leads us into the Feast of Sukkot. It does not say that Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, is a feast day, which is good because that would be incorrect. This, of course, makes much more sense because Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, kicks off or leads us into the fall or Sukkot which is indeed one of the feast days of Yahuwah. I hope all is solved. I hope. There are no more contradictions, and the new moon is clearly defined by examining the actual Hebrew. So in reality, after a thorough examination of Hebrew, Talim 81.3 should read something more like this. Blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon at the covering leading to our feast day. In the Hebrew, it reads like this, that we are to blow the shofar on Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, which is when the moon is covered in darkness, and Yom Teruah, day of trumpets, as a wake-up call or alarm, leads us into full light of the feast of Sukkot. What did we learn in this teaching? One, the calendar is intended to be simple and everything going forward should follow the pattern established in the first 16 verses in Bereshit. Two, the ancients had means to understanding even the most complex celestial cycle calculations. Three, the Hallel 2 calendar integrates traditions not found in scripture and thus should be discarded. Four, the Anuk Hanuk Enoch calendar at best is only um only obsolete uh is only obsolete observation, not instructional at best. As the observation in the book of Anuk, Enoch, Hanuk is not mathematically possible today. At worst, all of the book of Anuk, Enoch, Hanuk should be discarded because of the opening calendar section details how the observations were to be eternally standing, which is clearly not the case. These are just opinions. I'm not saying it has no value. These are just putting all the sides out there. I, 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 I do believe that there's value to the book of Anuk, um, the Ethiopian version, at least. Five, the beginning of the year is determined by the sun and stars as well as the Abib, the month that allows the first opportunity for the 15th day of the month, first day of unleavened bread, to fall on or after the equinox merits being the first month of the year. Six, the first night and day of the month is the same night and day period that the two to three minutes of the astronomical conjunction occurs between the sundown to sundown and Yasharal first night then day. The sighting of the sliver is confirmation that the conjunction did occur and that there was no error in the conjunction calculation. Next Sabbath! In the next teaching, we take all that we have learned from the Torah, from the writings, and from the prophets and compare that to how Yahushua practiced and taught his Abba's calendar. So, that's it for this time. I know that was a lot. Go back over it again um, because it is lengthy. As far as information, and uh, again, we did a pretty good, wow. That was a lot of information in a short amount of time. Did it seem to go fast? Or was it long? Jennifer, was it long? It was long. Mm -hmm. Even though the time was shorter than usual. Usually I go to seven. We only, we barely made six. You guys have any questions or comments? Uh, please uh, 
Give it to us now on anything, actually, as you so desire. Um, so we'll wait a little bit. Remember the procedure. I'll just write question or put a question mark. We'll know to wait. If we don't see that. Now, I, I am going to express a lot of this, um, the phases of the moon and things of this nature. I'm learning along with you. Um, as well, these these things are newer to me. I mean, I knew a little bit, but not into this depth. So, um, if you ask me more questions about this, I may have to re come back to you and research it a little bit more to get it fully down. Because, as I stated, I think in the first teaching, two teachings ago, um, I was one of those people who was being lazy and uh, was relying on uh, Nehemiah and Gordon, um, as the world did, the world of Torah believers. And we were, uh, and then when he dropped the mantle or let it go, then we were like, okay. And I saw this discapobulation within the the Torah Zoran community, no matter where what they called themselves. So, and just to help us to lead right up into the feast days that are coming up, Pesach being the first one, and then we'll learn some more specifically about that. Um, any questions? Thank you. Sure, she's asking or saying she has one, but let's wait. Okay, absolutely. I'm not quite sure, but find out. Oh, you put Q. Okay, I put yeah. question mark. Same thing. If I saw any of those, yeah, I'd, I'd know. If it was a question put a Q, mark. put a question mark. If you want to write out question, mm -hmm. just let us know somehow. Yeah, I think she's asking, can we put in prayer requests? Yes, absolutely. Put in prayer requests, please. It took me so long to finally get the technique and proper form down. I remember when I was still learning it myself, how mm -hmm. much I struggled. Uh, I want a big one. I really want a big one. Can you give me a big one? There's six left. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like I was, you know, like, six left. <laughs> <laughs> Is she writing out a question? I don't know. Yes, it's Regina. If, 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 um, if anybody wants to give a prayer request, please do. Mm -hmm. Just type that you're writing. Yeah, just let us know. Write Q, P, question mark, whatever you like. That's how we'll know. Give us a second. I can't, I can't read it from this. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, that situation. Yeah, it's really hard to read from there. <laughs> I need to move this situation. <laughs> mm. Or maybe Virginia's asking. 
asking them if they have prayer requests. I was thinking that too. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Okay, well, um, we're going to go ahead and close because I don't see anything up. Should, should we? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we should go ahead. I think something would have popped up by now. <laughs> Forgive us. Um, if you Again, if you would like to contact this ministry, please do. Do at the end of the service, it'll, it'll allow you to uh, do that. Or it'll give you information so that you can be able to do that. It'll allow <laughs> you to do that. <laughs> but um, I guess it kind of does because it gives you the information. And, um, you know, really meditate on these things. And um, look, I know this is deep, but, you know, we got to go deep in Father's Word sometimes and eat that rich food. Don't choke on it, though. But uh, let's pray. Let's pray. Join me in prayer. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, Yahuwah, you are our King. You are our Father. You are our Creator. You are the lover of our souls. And Father, help us to honor you the way we are supposed to, Father, from our souls. Help us to desire to love you the way you love us, the way we want to be loved. Help us to return that to you and give that to you. Because we know that what we sow will reap. And a lot of times people read that scripture and they, they think about it in a negative way. But it's a positive to that as well. It's either, it's either way. That you're not one to be mocked. That what a man sows, he shall reap. That's whether good or bad. So Father, help us to, to learn to put out selflessness. To put out love. To put out compassion. To put out comfort. To be a, a listening ear. Instead of always wanting to talk. That we'll do that for people, Father, so that we can show your love to those all around us. And they may be allured by that. They may say, you know what? What do you do? And How come you're the way you are? Because we're supposed to be going out, teaching them, the nations, what we have been taught. That's, a, that's the mandate you've given us, Father. Help us to fulfill that. We need your help. Help us not to be distracted. By our own flesh, by Hasatan, joining up with our flesh and pushing us forward. Father, help us really grab hold of this information that, is, that you're bringing forth for us to learn your ways. We know this is in preparation for when we reign with Yahusha, that we'll know this and we'll be able to go out in the territories that you've given us to uh, reign over in behalf of Yahusha and to teach those um, the correct way. Of all things, of all your instructions, of all your Torah. So thank you for giving us a, a head start, Father. Um, it, it's like it's like when those guys uh, join the military in high school. I forget what it's called, and then they can join the military and already be a higher rank. I see that's what you're doing with us, Father. So thank you, Father. I pray over the Mishpacha um, deliverance. I rebuke the spirit of rebellion. And I call for your ruach of, of humility to be strong with us, Father. To submit ourselves to you in your ways. And to receive rich blessings in return as you have said and spoken to us about these things. That when we obey, we are a Barutaka people. We're blessed. And in that being blessed, we're blessed to be a blessing to all those around us. Hallelujah. Father, uh, right now, I want to lift up our dear brother Amal and the situation that he's in. Father, thank you for using him in such an amazing way. And we ask that you keep him safe um, as, as these things uh, roll out. Thank you for planting him where he is to be a light, a light of righteousness for you, Father. And in that, have him stand firm. Let no weapon form against him. Prosper. Matter of fact, we declare right now that it cannot they cannot prosper against him as he does your will, Father, in right ruling and righteousness. Hallelujah. If anything, Father, lift him up and have him be highly esteemed in, in, in for your glory, for you to be esteemed in all things. Father, if there's any worry, we ask that, 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 that you give comfort to all those who may be worrying about that. And to, and to know that you're, you're there, Father. That nothing can happen when your hand is upon your people. Hallelujah. We look forward to the testimony that will come out of that. Father, I want to pray over all the, all the families, all the marriages, all the children. 
that they're not distracted, that they won't look to the left or to the right, that they'll be strengthened and renewed. As we talked about renewing of the moon, Father, they're renewed and refreshed in your Ruach. Father, that it, this, this, from this moment on, entering into the next month that we're following, uh, getting ready to be led into, that they'll be stronger than they were this last month. That there'll be a maturing, a growing in you, in your word, and in love for you and for your people and for the world at large. Again, Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your college, in your school, that you chose us to be here, and what an honor and privilege it is. So, Father, let us not miss anything this coming week that you've uh, given us within every day to do all that we need to do, all that you've called us to do, and provide all our needs as you already have before the foundation of the earth. It was already supplied to us. And Yahushua is my name. We declare and decree all these things. Hallelujah. So let it be. So it shall be. Hallelujah. All right. Until next Sabbath. Shalom. Shalom. Yahuwah, we love you. We ain't got nothing